They were the police officers that came round to his flat in Leeds. Jimmy Savile had Margaret Thatcher. Jimmy Savile had access to Broadmoor. Jimmy Savile had Edwina Curry. Jimmy Savile had Prince Charles. Jimmy Savile had everybody. All of us, what we call the peoples, knew what was going on with the BBC. As bad as we now know it was? Yeah, we knew. But what has been lost is those people that could have stopped it from happening, or those people who had knowledge about it. So out of those 44 reviews, not a single person has been held to account. Thanks for watching the podcast. Here's a word from our sponsor, Atlas VPN. Right now, I'm going to change my phone so that I am registered out of America. Let's go with Dallas, Texas, shall we? Just like that, I can now access everything online that our American friends can access, whereas previously I was blocked. And we've got the best VPN deal on the market. Enjoy the most affordable online protection for just $1.83 a month, which is just over a pound. And three months extra with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Protect unlimited devices. Atlas VPN protects all your devices with a single subscription. You can grab this summer deal now because Atlas VPN Premium is just $1.83 a month. Plus three months extra. And with a 30-day money-back guarantee, protect your privacy and get many benefits of Atlas VPN for the ridiculously low price. You can take this deal by clicking the link in the video description below on YouTube. Be quick as it's a limited time offer. Thanks for checking out our sponsor, Back to the Podcast. People might question why we are doing this documentary. After all, Savile was exposed years ago and his crimes were scrutinised by media worldwide. It's common knowledge that Jimmy Savile was a prolific We know that there were hundreds of victims abused over decades. This film, free from the constraints of mainstream media, is for direct online broadcast. We have more time to reveal information. We can probe further and investigate the darkest areas offering viewers a full portrait of the disgraced celebrity. Over the last year, we have interviewed people with a unique insight into Savile. Some were victims. One spoke about a friend who had committed suicide after being abused. 
we spoke to journalists who highlighted the numerous cover-ups by various institutions. And we spoke to the man responsible for first exposing the paedophile. The Jimmy Savile story is unique in criminal history. Now we know the facts, we can reflect on what happened. Several questions still need to be answered surrounding the aftermath of Savile's exposure. The main being, how the hell did this guy get away with it for a lifetime? He said, I reckon there's probably around 20, 30 victims. And I went, 500. I said, there are 500. And he looked at me and he went, really? And I went, I can tell you, I've been doing this for a long time now. I said, I reckon there's 500 victims. And of course, where did we get to? 500 victims. How many of Savile's victims were male then? So there were a number of male. I don't know what that number worked out to, but there were a number that were overwhelmingly they were female. Uh, and they overwhelmingly were children, but they were adult females and there were a number of male victims. His offending behaviour was was overwhelmingly females. But what he did do is on the occasions, I think he targeted young males because he saw that as a power and control, but not not in the same degree at all as far as females, young victims. But he does enter into a quite... I say unique, quite limited number of offenders who cross across all the spectrums as far as male, female, young and old. Large majority of paedophiles, child sex offenders, have a target age group. Savile wasn't like that. It's not really about sex. It really isn't. And and that's, you know, the case, in fact, with some of the uh, perpetrators I talked to in prison who don't really talk about it about the sex they sort of uh, they talk about love they talk about needs they talk about uh, all sorts of things that are not really about sex and I think with Jimmy Savile uh, you know there's something kind of rather androgynous and unsexual about him and it wasn't about sex it's the fact that he could do this you know yeah in interviews he always joked about not knowing what love meant yeah. We also spoke to oh. Charles Halligan. Oh, did you? He's a close friend Ooh. and colleague from Leeds General Infirmary. Ooh. He told us this. He's always had a knife for the ladies. Um, young ones as well. When I say young, I mean, you know, the proper age. 16 upwards. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's always had one. His philosophy he would never get married because I don't think he could stick with the person more than three days. Is he right? When it comes to women, you've got a short attention span? No, women know too much. I'm all for girls that don't know too much. It's a different class, you see. Uh, when you are single, it's because of some reason that you like being single. Uh, uh, Jesus didn't find any problem with it. I don't find any problem with it. Uh, a lot of the time, <laughs> people say, what? You're still single, you never got married. Why didn't you get married? The answer is, I have the faintest idea. But we don't, don't believe know. that J Jesus was quite a ladies' man, though you are, or have said you were. No, 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 he, he used to knock about with the ladies, it says so in the book. The period of time between his offending behaviour certainly moved between the 60s all the way up to the late 2000s. So I think his last offending was around 2007, 2008, something like that, and his earliest offending in the 1960s. Uh, in his, his offending didn't change that much. It became less aggressive in the latter years. He became older. Uh, but in the early years, aggression, power and control were one crucial element of his offending behaviour. He was, he was a particularly nasty early offender. I think it probably would be fair to say that the majority of his victims were from a vulnerable element, not just in terms of their age, but because of their, their social background. So perhaps they sought out the opportunity to, to spend time away from home. They didn't have that relationship perhaps where they spent a lot of time at home, which would take them away from being in an environment with Savile. And of course, Savile had 
status around him quite quickly he became this local dj you know he when you go back to his very early days he created this this discoy club and then that took him onto the scene in terms of then doing um the bbc stuff and of course he became a massive massive name uh, and so i think the large majority of the, his victims were of that that society where they perhaps sought out something away from their home life not all of them there were a lot of people who were very you know very loved at home and, and very cared for uh, because Savile didn't discriminate either way what Savile did do of course and this is not just Savile this is any offender is they're very clear in terms of their targeting so offenders very quickly will realize whether you are the right person to target they'll do certain things they might say things they might do things that actually test the waters in terms of whether or not they can push the boundaries uh, and and therefore if they get away with it they'll continue and of course if they're blocked or they don't or the response isn't what is positive they won't do it so they target them and of course the more vulnerable you are the more seeking you are of having some kind of relationship whether that be in a purely platonic way but 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 forming that kind of relationship. I mean, there are people out there who see someone on telly and think they know them. Yeah. You know, they see that person and automatically they have that relationship with them. And I get that. That's fine. You know, but I think that way then there were people that obviously sought Savile out because of who he was and because of his status and thought, you know, well, actually he's an opening to this. And Savile did for some, not to the degree, of course, that others. You know, Max Clifford was a classic one. You know, this, this um, couch scenario where he offered people opportunities to to get into modelling or to get into television or to get into film. Uh, but Savile did that to some. Very well. You realise, of course, that I must tonight kidnap all your ladies. Because I have learned to love them. I don't know which one I want yet, quite. Excuse me, I don't want to rush this. <laughs> Why do you think someone like Savile got away with it until he died versus someone like Gary Glitter who got busted? And lots of other uh, people who got blasted. Just the sheer scale. The fact that he was uh, uh, Jimmy Savile, the fact that he was friends with uh, people in royalty, he was too big to topple. And I think that's that there's a lesson to be learned there. Nobody should be too big to topple. But but uh uh you know he 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 was such an important uh part of the entertainment industry. He 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 knew so many people. Um he was nasty, you know, uh, people who had personal dealings with him say he was very nasty, you know, he was he was you know, his public persona was not his real persona. Um, uh, you know, he was rich, uh, you know, he drove around in Rolls Royces and stuff. He was a do-gooder. So people say, oh, Jimmy, so you can't believe that. So he had everything going for him to stop this, as well as the, uh, as we mentioned before, the lawyers uh, in newspapers who would be reluctant to go for him. So so that, that in every respect, he was in a perfect position to do what he did. So victims fall into many different categories. Often people say that actually the more severe the offence against people, the more difficult it is for someone to talk about it. But actually that ignores the fact that the impact of an individual of an offence differs depending on what has happened to you. So somebody might be raped, but they might deal with that really well. Another person might be indecently touched but their impact on them is greater than the person that's been raped. So when you look at it in terms of the, the severity of the offence, that fails to ignore the impact of the individual. So when you're talking to these people, it is literally about saying to them, look, you know, these are very difficult things that have happened perhaps in your life, uh, but we need to be, I'd like to be able to talk about it. And by and large, because of my experience and my use to be able to deal with that, you know, I'm, a, I'm a experienced in interviewing children, in adults, in terms of sexual offences. So I know exactly how to talk to people without doing all the triggers. But crucially, what you do find is that the only way that people can move on with their life is to deal with what's happened in the past. And that applies to so many environments. So when you say that he knew people's secrets, are you implying that there were possibly powerful co-conspirators in his crimes absolutely yeah and whether they were whether they're perceived to be as powerful as him i'd say not i think he was the most powerful by overwhelmingly 
but there are other co-offenders with him who offended with him. No doubt about that. We got evidence, compelling evidence in relation to that. And there are a couple, I think, that have been prosecuted or certainly going through that process. Uh, and there are others that have got away with it. But there's no doubt that overwhelmingly, Savile committed his offences on his own, overwhelmingly. But there are a small number of occasions when he committed offences with other people and he knew exactly what their offences were and of course he had the power and control over them so he was able then to to bring him into his confidence and, and have that power over him. The suggestion that he was part of some paedophile network, no. I mean people who've suggested that are people who don't understand firstly how paedophile operates and secondly how Jimmy Savile offended. Jimmy Savile was the type of person who could not he would not have offended against somebody else so he would not have offended had that other person either not been offending with in in the same room as him but he was also very careful because he knew that his world could come down very very quickly and very few offenders co commit their offenses this idea that there are lots and lots of paedophile rings operating all over the place is just not true there are people that share lots of other child abuse material with other people that doesn't make them a paedophile ring. It just simply says, means that they've shared with other people their material. So the charity, all raising all the millions, did he use that as a shield to protect himself? Yeah, I think it's... So I've quoted, and I was quoted in the Radio Times for saying this man created some of his shows as a vehicle for his offending behaviour. And I truly believe that he did because the elements of offending behaviour are twofold access and opportunity right so the access to children and the opportunity to offend so he created the access to children through his vehicles through his ability to be able to see children spend time with children and his opportunity was to be alone with them because he was this respectable individual so he got access to children and the opportunity and so those two key elements of offending behavior were present and i believe that he created some of those opportunities now whether he created every opportunity in order to offend i doubt it because people are not bad all the time they're just bad either a bit of the time or a lot of the time so even in the worst individuals there are positive traits in regards to those people so i don't believe that that was a forefront of his thoughts all the time but it obviously was a an, a large element and that enabled him to offend to the degree that he did which was at uh, some stage off the scale he was offending probably every day at some stage do you think the astronomical amount of money raised for charity insulated him? That was another factor. Uh, uh, all of it, as I say, was a do-gooder, you know. And uh, uh, if you set out to be an abuser, uh, you'd probably set out to do what Jimmy Savile did, wouldn't you? You'd, you'd say, oh, I'll become a famous TV personality. I'll, I'll do all this thing for children's hospitals and whatever. I mean, he did it all brilliantly. You have to, you, you know, you almost have to admire how clever he was in his, in his uh, predation, uh, you know, cho choosing children's hospitals, kind of being a, a humble porter, you know, uh, as we mentioned before, kind of which gave him access. I mean, he did everything right. And then having, you know, friends at the, 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 the high places. Um, uh you know, he 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 thought it out. He was not stupid. It, it's, it's not a coincidence. You know, of all these things he did, it was all very well thought out. Just as, you know, my humble care worker in a children's home who who does it thought it out of how do I get access to kids. He thought it out as well, and he just thought it out at a much higher level. Now, me when I stand in front of the table and St Peter's there, he says you are not coming in. Uh, and I'll say, well, why not? And he'll say, because you're a villain. And, and he'll show me the debit side. And I'll say, hang about. And I'll show him the credit side. And he'll say, does that mean anything? And if he says, that means nothing, then I'll threaten to break his fingers. Uh, some guy sees me as a sinner. Some guy sees me as a villain. Some guy sees me as wasting my time. You see me as an uncle. We can't understand how people see us. But we say, if you see me as an uncle, I'll try and be a nice uncle to you. I'll see you later. During his lifetime, he gave clues as to his dark side. To a News of the World report, he said, I'm no saint. I want it to be known. I'm a great crumpet man. In 1974, a People headline told readers, Why I never married? I can have my pick 
of $25 per night. While he was alive, there were rumours. All of us, what we call the peoples, knew what was going on with the BBC. As bad as we now know it was? Yeah, we knew. We all knew. We knew that you go to Top of the Pops, what you were facing. It, it, it was common knowledge, but it wasn't common knowledge in the media. I heard the rumours, but I was working in an environment that was totally male. Do you really think that if I had got, said to something, somebody at the BBC higher up than me, this is going on, nobody took any note, they wouldn't have taken any notice whatsoever. Mm. Eight-year-old girls love Jimmy Savile, though, don't they? And of yeah. course... Anyway, I won't go on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he loves her slot. That's what I'm saying. Three life sentences. <laughs> a spokesman said, you think you know a guy, and then he goes and does something like that. Journalists and filmmakers probed. They kind of already knew the truth. When challenged, he put up a shield and denied the rumours time and time again. And a gentleman never grusses on ladies as ever. But we're not asking for names, we're oh. just asking for the general principle. Oh, so I mean... We just I mean, want to know if you live this sort well, of playboy say, life of the DJ. Yeah, give or take a, a few nice ladies. <laughs> but I mean... You know, you, uh, a gentleman doesn't ever speak of ladies. I, mean, I don't know where you come from. I mean, I don't know what your circles are, but my circle, <laughs> ladies, are uh, very... You don't grass on them. The Sunday Mirror and other papers heard stories about Savile over the years. Victims reported their stories, but editors always chose not to run the stories. Savile was quick to threaten legal action, was adept at playing the media... From your experience working in the press, do you have any knowledge of media investigations into Savile or knowledge of similar cases where the press had to sit on a story for fear of being sued? Um, well, we were often scared of being sued. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I did some quite investigative stuff uh, when I worked on the independent newspaper. Um, and, you know, the lawyers... Uh, uh, they they don't they didn't have a final say. The editors have the final say, but but you know if the lawyers strongly counsel against doing something, uh, you have to uh, accept that. With Jimmy Savile, uh, I mean yes, he was litigious, and so it's difficult to uh, then actually uh, go right up against him. He was very famous. Uh, he was uh, you know quite powerful. Um, so I I do I, Sean I partly understand this but actually I still wonder about it you know that because I did even on the independent when I was there in the in the in the nineties the there was stuff coming up about uh, Jimmy Savile and and people people would kind of occasionally mention it so so clearly they heard rumors rumors about these stories um, and. You have to devote quite a lot of resources to it. I mean, you you, you have to, for example, I mean, look at the uh, the Chicago, sorry, the uh, Boston story of the the priest that was then the film, you know, and and uh, you you then look at that film and you see that it took them, you know, a long, long time to nail that priest, you know, literally years. Literally, they had to wait till they found a, a really good witness and so on. So some of it is just uh, lack of resources. But even then, I do wonder just why nobody quite had the guts to do it. I, and I suppose, uh, you know, did they, did they, you know, were they prevented from doing so somehow? Okay, let's imagine what would, you know, the front page story would be very, very big. You know, uh, Jimmy Stavell in sex scandal, you know, uh, witnesses, blah, blah, blah. You know, it, 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 it would have been a really, really big story. Um, uh, you know, bigger probably than any other uh, sex scandal story we've had. He, he, was, he was a really powerful character uh, in, on the TV every, you know, every week or, or several times a week. And... Um, you know, it would have taken a, a lot of guts to do it. If I arrive at the gates of heaven and St. Peter says, you've been a very tricky man, 
you can't come in here. I'll break his thumbs. Because I'm qualified to do that. Because I earned a living being a wrestler. Break his, and I've never had a problem yet with anybody whose thumbs I've broke. <laughs> You talk about that, though, as if there's reasons for you going downstairs. Do you have a conscience about that? Is there stuff you've done that think you think will deny you access to the big man? No. Jimmy Savile died in October 2011. He was seen as a national treasure... A British eccentric with decades of fame. He was viewed as a hero for the millions he raised for charity. A friend of royalty and senior politicians, Savile was knighted by the Queen and the Pope. So, Savile was a friend of Margaret Thatcher. When Charles and Di had marital problems, he was brought in as a marriage guidance counsellor by the royal family. How does a, you know, a guy from the north, very humble roots, disc jockey, rise to such associations? It's personality, Sean. It, it, you know, he, he did have a, uh, you know, uh, I mean, as I said, I don't think he was particularly funny, but he had a, a, a certain wit about him. Uh, uh I don't think one could say charm, really. He wasn't very charming. It was, like psychopaths are described as charming. Yeah, like that. yeah. I suppose. I suppose you know, uh, you know, maybe he made people laugh a bit with his stupid laugh himself and his kind of whole, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, I didn't know that actually. That he was actually asked at a marriage council. You can't. It, it, I mean, you can't imagine anybody worse, really. <laughs> I mean, well, Princess Diana wrote that he was creepy. She found him very creepy. Good for her, yes. <laughs> I'm not surprising. Uh, she got it, you know, for once, Princess, as usual, Princess Diana got it better than uh, Charles or his mother. Uh, it, I mean, it. it I, th I think you maybe you have to understand uh, that actors enter people in the entertainment industry jump a class or two don't they i mean they might come from humble roots but uh they they, they actually jump out you only have to look at the beatles who are kind of like royalty now or Scylla black you know one of our great uh, uh singers uh who you know became a, just a household name and she was on all sorts of tv programs dating programs and as well as being a, a, a singer that that People in the entertainment industry are kind of déclassé in a way. They 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 jump at you know. We have this entrenched class system in the UK uh, that uh, you know generally people can't escape from. But the one escape, and I think this is true in America as well, that that uh, you know real uh, stars kind of get out of of uh, of their class, and so so they then become part of the the red carpet elite. Um, and that's maybe why they that uh, you know the royal family were being dumb enough to work out the marital problems of somebody who should never have married that young woman anyway. <laughs> and, uh, that's another whole story, but it wasn't uh, it wasn't an issue that could be solved by counselling. It was an issue that that should never have taken place in the first time because he was, as we know, uh, consorting with somebody else all the way through. But um, you know that's that. So I suppose it was like a bit of kind of uh, pulling uh, Savile out as a bit of a figurehead, wasn't it? It was a kind of, you know, sh sh somebody who was kind of very famous. Oh, we're showing we're doing something about this. So I can understand the red carpet effect and Savile mesmerising the masses, being on the TV all the time. To waltz into Buckingham Palace, whereby there's a Royal Protection Police Force who would investigate, you know, your background... And they would have probably been aware of the accusations against him. Why would they allow the royals, top royals, to associate with someone who had such claims against him? Yes, that's a good question. I, I'm, may, I can only think that they didn't investigate him sufficiently because I think if they had, they would have come across that. And, you know, remember, he became Sir Jimmy Savile, didn't he? You know, uh, so he was knighted. So he was uh, in and out. And he was in the in Buckingham Palace. He was a friend of Prince Charles's, wasn't he? I mean, he yeah. actually was a friend, quote, unquote. You know, like that they actually, 
uh, did things together. Um, you know, when it was seen in public, kind of, kind of together. So, um, uh, I think he was above reproach. Come on, Sean, if you get up there, really up there, you're above reproach, mate. You know, you 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 kind of, you know, nobody's question. I mean, nobody would look at David Beckham and think, oh, oh we better check him out, whether he was done for shoplifting when he was 12 or something. You know, they, they, you, you get you get kind of, you get above all that. And I think that that's what happened. And, and the, the English upper classes are, are, are daft enough to be taken in by, by that sort of uh, uh, um, uh, kind of uh, scale of, you know, getting up so high that uh, nobody's going to question you. I think, I think they were taken in by that. You think he was an illusionist? Yes, then? absolutely. When he was finally exposed... His fall from grace shocked the world. Never before has someone's reputation fallen in such a manner. He was a complex man with several sides to his personality. He could easily flip between roles, from charity worker to famous DJ, from abuser to TV personality, to all-round fixer of things. Supposedly, yourself have said that you've had hundreds of girls in planes, trains, etc. Yeah. Surely this is a contradiction in terms of your own religious beliefs. Well, it all depends, you see. I'm like a blip on the side of life, and I just do my thing and mind my own business and do it away and uh, seem to be getting into trouble for it. One did prove to be untouchable, and that is Jimmy Savile. How was he able to get um, away with it for so long. Well, Jimmy Savile was clever because he made sure he had friends in every element. So Jimmy Savile had what he called his Monday club. They were the police officers that came round to his flat in Leeds. Jimmy Savile had Margaret Thatcher, who tried to get him ennobled, I think it was 14 times or something. Every time her advisors said no. But he kept pestering her. Jimmy Savile had access to Broadmoor. Jimmy Savile had Edwina Curry. Jimmy Savile had Prince Charles. Jimmy Savile had everybody. He found his way because he was clever. He knew that if he knew somebody in every circuit, he'd always have a way out. He'd go, well, he got, and anytime, when he was questioned by Louis Farouk in that car when they were driving in Scotland, um, he was asked, um, have you, you know, people say things about you. He said, they can say whatever they want about me. He said, if they say any more, I'll bring them all down. Wow. And that was, and you watch, watch the Louis Peru program. I, I advise you to see it. And you will see him say that in the back of a car. And he was open. About it. He was open about everything he did. He was a, he just thought that you know, he could just carry on regardless. And people like Max Clifford enabled these people with their fake stories. So Max Clifford would trade a story. That recent program on the BBC or Channel 4, whatever it was, I don't know why they showed it, it was pointless, said, oh, you know, he just, he just did this and he did that. And he did. No, he traded X to protect Y. They knew that that was their game. They actually viewed it as a game. So they all worked together. It's power, it's money. You're talking about the Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher at the time. She sent him a letter buttering him up, giving him the biggest ass kissing he's ever had. Pope John Paul II, a papal knighthood, recommended by Basil Hume. You have then have, I'm going to bring up Keir Starmer, because round about 98, he was in charge of the CPS. It could have been round about, it might have been a bit later. He even apologised after Savile died and said, I'm sorry we didn't take the chance. Now, the only reason he didn't take the chance is because if he went to court and he was found not guilty, Starmer's arse is kicked, he's out of a job. He don't get his knighthood. But he gets his knighthood for failure. 
like everyone else has got that knighthood. People get knighthood and rewarded for failure. The people at Broadmoor have got rewarded for failure. They've been put in some high, high jobs. If I failed, I'd get me arse kicked. If you fail, Sean, you'd get a big kicking over it. The same as everyone else in this room. If we fail or balled up, but if you're in power and you've got money, you will get the biggest arse lick from the establishment that you've ever got. So we've seen a parallel with this celebrity association then whereby Epstein had pictures of like himself with the Clintons plastered all over the place. And Savile had pictures of him with Elvis Presley, the Beatles. Yeah. These pictures were duplicated and and um, yeah. put throughout various of his locations. Barbara Bush, that was another one. She had um, time with him. James Wilson Vincent Savile was aptly born on Halloween in 1926. He was one of seven children to parents Agnes and Vince. He was the youngest child and possibly an unplanned child, born five years after his next youngest sibling. The Savills were working class. Jimmy was a small, undernourished child and often ill. One account details an accident where, as an infant, he fell out of a pram, severing a muscle in his neck. When the muscle refused to heal, he was left with an unusual condition whereby he couldn't close his eyes. He slept with his eyes wide open, staring at the ceiling. He would have spasms. Doctors wanted to operate on him, but his mother wouldn't let them. Eventually, the infant recovered. For some time, his parents had feared the worst. Alright, so a huge part of your book, Broadmoor Sinister, is the Savile story. And you went and researched his entire family upbringing, did you? Yeah. Because yeah. he had a strange medical situation whereby his eyes wouldn't close, didn't he? And, yeah, and, it's, and he was like the miracle child that he exists. You know, he didn't. They, die. they say. I mean, yeah. what his brother? He had a brother called John and another brother called Vincent. And as they grew older, they tell him and they tell the stories that he was a, a, a gifted child. This is why him and his mum, who we called the Duchess, were very close. Agnes. Um, it was about three month old that he actually, or four month old that he was actually being pushed in the buggy and. He, fell out the buggy, causing substantial injuries, which resulted in Savile being placed into a hospital for three months. They actually thought they were going to lose him. Um, and as time gone on, he, he was the sort of dream child of all the brothers and all the sisters. He was the one that they all sort of rallied round. You know, they, they, he was that type of special kid to them. And how do you think that played into his psychology then his feelings of you know invincibility and superiority do you think that anchors back to his miraculous survival of his illness i think it probably anchors back to if you've got that child that's that everyone rallies around it makes you feel special yeah so then you can start playing the game of pitting one off against the other that's just where i think that half the trouble you know if he wants something, if someone wasn't going to go give it to him, he'd ask somebody else. Um, he didn't pit his parents off against each other because he didn't have really much to do with his father. I mean, his father died in, I think it's 1955. He was an insurance salesman. He just went out to work and come back. It was his mother and his siblings. But they all, he paired them off against each other. Savile lived through the Second World War. Leeds wasn't bombed as badly as other cities. He didn't evacuate and remained in the West Yorkshire city for the entire conflict. During this time, he took an interest in dance halls. 
He lost his virginity at a young age to a young woman he had met in a dance hall. From his own accounts, he was around 13 to 15 at that time. He described the encounter as both embarrassing and terrifying. In 1944, 18-year-old Jimmy Savile was conscripted into the coal mines. He worked at three different mines in Yorkshire and may have remained in the pits if it wasn't for an accident that ended that career. A mile and a half away from the pit bottom and two miles from the coal face. So what I did, I took all my clothes off because it was very warm down the pit. I took all my clothes off and folded them in a newspaper and worked in the noddy, right? <laughs> and I saved a little bit of water in the bottle and just before it was knocking off time, I cleaned my hands off and cleaned my face off, right? And I got back into the pit bottom immaculate. <laughs> now then nobody but nobody ever did eight hours down a pit and came back as immaculate as the set off with white shirt and everything like that. <laughs> they were quite convinced that I was a witch. <laughs> and I never said a word. And I suddenly realised that if you were different, and he didn't say anything about it, you see. Yeah. It's had a tremendous effect on yes. people, and that stayed with me for ages. And if you go to South Kirby now, you'll get some of the old miners when you say, Jimmy Savile's done well, hasn't he? Ah, oh, and he'll look around and he'll say, he's not what you think you know. <laughs> the forces of darkness are at work there. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the first time that I realised that to be different made you different. What was it like for him growing up? Wasn't a lot of like mining activity in that region and didn't he eventually yeah. become a miner yeah he become what they're known as a bevan boy um which means he couldn't fight in the second world war so he was um conscripted down to the mines at an early age um that didn't last very long because he actually had an ex accident down in the mines it, it was an explosion that um rendered his back useless um that didn't last very long at all i mean he, he claims to be um, you know, you probably see him at the seventh half later in life, you know, with the Bevan boys and, and you know, on the um, Remembrance Sunday. But um, that was a very short period of his life. That wasn't something to be, you know, brag about extensively. I mean, you're literally a couple of months down the mine. So was that part of his uh, myth and his legend? You know, it came from such humble roots yeah yeah he, he used that quite a lot with people i mean he he played on the um the downtrodden bit you know my mum's hard working she had to bring up seven kids um my father went out to work hard to support the family well in fact he was say an insurance broker but he was also a bookmaker as well so of course in them times off-street bookmakers wasn't the dumb thing um he spent a lot of time with his brother Vincent and a lot of time with his brother John. Um, and Vincent was to become a key later in life. Savile was a keen cyclist who took part in the very first tour of Britain. He maintained an interest in fitness throughout his life. Known for his love of running he took part in numerous marathons over the years. Savile started his media career as a manager in dance halls. Successful in this role, he built a strong reputation as an innovative DJ. Thank you for watching the podcast. Here's a word from our sponsor, Rocket Money. Don't you hate it when you've got subscriptions out there that you don't know about, taking all that cash out of your account? I recently found out I had four Amazon Prime subscriptions, now I've got it down to one. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. Most people think they're spending $80 on their subscriptions, when in reality the number is closer to $200. When you're signed up for so many things like streaming services you used to watch one show, or free trials for delivery you don't use, it's so easy to lose track of what you're paying for. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions and manage your money the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. That's rocketmoney.com, 
S-H-A-U-N, rocketmoney.com slash Sean. Thanks for supporting our sponsor. Link is in the description box on YouTube. Back to the podcast. After Savile sort of left the mining industry and recuperated, um, what happened then was that uh, his brother Vincent got Jimmy into nightclubs, being a disc jockey. So that's how he got into nightclubs. It was through his brother. Yeah. His brother's a key to a lot of things. Not a lot of people know, but Vincent was a bit of a villain. Was he? Yes. He was well known in the underworld scene. He had money. um, He had power. Um, Which I think is what Jimmy Savile played on. What kind of rackets would his brother have been doing back then? Cigarette rackets. Booze rackets. Um, The nightclub game would have been one of them as well because you can hide a lot behind the nightclub. I mean, it's Manchester. You're talking the 50s, early 50s. Um, up to the 60s. I mean, that's the time when, you know, you sell booze and fags and just after the war, everyone's in want. All right, so he gets this nightclub job then. Now, in the, the Louis Thoreau program, he talks about a situation in a nightclub. Yeah. And he kind of reveals that he had some guy tied up in the basement, I think yeah. it was. Are you able to expand on that? I, I am. I mean, I, I put it down to... Jimmy using his brother's Vincent's know-how because all Jimmy was in the club at the time was a DJ. He was spinning records. He was the first one to get people up dancing to records. He was, he was, and what made him popular was he, he drew the crowds in. Then just as that started, started, um, what his brother suggested was, you know, run nightclubs. So he got Jimmy into running three nightclubs in the Manchester area. Now, Jimmy said this is a bit of a power trip because his attitude was, you come into my club, you behave. You don't behave. You know, it, it was known to take him downstairs, he'd tie him up and they would get a good beating, you know. I mean, he played on the fear guard. I mean, his brother, Vincent, is the one that everyone was feared of. So Jimmy used it. You, you know, I mean, he used that to, to his advantage. He never let on in later life, I asked my brother, it was Vincent is the key to everything. So how did he get his lucky break then? His lucky break came in the 60s. There was a radio station called Radio Luxembourg, which probably a lot of people would have heard of. He was picked up um, for Radio Luxembourg, um, and that's where he got his lucky break. Um, He had hundreds of thousands of listeners all over Europe. Um, very popular radio slots in the evening. Um, and that took him for a number of years. And he was at, then it, eventually the BBC got wind. Um, and that's how he got the Radio 1 job. He, you know, he, he, he spent many years at Luxembourg. BBC, you know, they, they, was, uh, they, they pulled him in. Moving into radio, he became a DJ for the BBC. I'll tell you what we'll do now, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, top groups, top records, top everything. So how's about we have a nice record now by what is definitely one of the top groups. In fact, it was voted the top group in the Rhythm and Blues section this year, 1967. Can no other down the one and only the Rolling Stones. And here they come right now. In television, he hosted programs such as Top of the Pops, which I'll never forget, and Clunk Click. But his most famous show was Jim Will Fix It, which made him a national icon. Running for over 20 years, some episodes of the show pulled in over 30 million viewers. We got the letter from Mary Reed from St Albans, and she says, Dear Jim, I have always had an itching to ride on a dolphin's back. I can swim very well. I'm 14 years old. Please could you try and fix it for me? Savile's career gave him access to star-struck teenagers. Good evening. Welcome. Another edition of Top of the Pops. Lots of nice young ladies about with us this evening. And lots of nice records we've got. So what we're going to do, we're going to start off at number nine. This girl's crazy about this group that's going to start. It's number 19, isn't it? It's called Coco. What's the name of the group? Sweet. Yeah, she's crazy about them. Here they are. He was famous, wealthy, and inclined to exploiting his fans. In the early days of his promiscuous life, 
He preyed on countless groupies. Talking to writer and biographer Dan Davies, Savile revealed this about his days as a DJ. I would stand on the stage with a record player with a thousand people in the room for four or five hours. Of the thousand people, 700 were girls. If half of them can't stand you, that leaves 350 who can stand you. If half of them are not too keen on you at all, then the other half is. That's 125 people. If half of them actually don't fancy you, that leaves around 65 girls that might want to go off with you. You don't have to be a brain surgeon to work out that you're never going to be short of ladies' company. This story reveals a lot about how Savile viewed women. It was all a numbers game to him. Women were his sex objects. Someone who knew Savile during his Manchester DJ days recalled how colleagues would joke that Savile was either going to be a huge success or end up in prison for having sex with underage girls. It was a sign of the times. People didn't think, as they do now, to report paedophilia as a crime. Don't forget, as late as the 1970s, the government was giving hundreds of thousands in grants to an organisation known as P.I.E. Pi, the Paedophile Information Exchange. In today's society, it is unthinkable that such an organisation could show a public face. Times were different back then, is one of the reasons why victims weren't so readily coming forward. It's very likely that 400 of you will be injured in your cars tomorrow. You'll be within six miles of home and doing less than 30. And it's going to happen to a lot of you ladies. You'll be shopping, collecting the kids, going to the laundry. For some of you, the face you'll start out with in the morning won't be the same face you end up with by the evening. Why let it happen? Clunk, click, it's so simple. Clunk the car door, click the seat belt. Even if you are just going round the corner, clunk, click every trip. Further evidence that mentalities were different back then is the fact that a woman came forward in 2012 to reveal she had been raped by Savile, aged 16 in a London hotel in 1964. She had been a virgin at the time. Finding out she was pregnant and confronted by her parents, she disclosed who the father was. The parents contacted Savile, who refused to admit responsibility. The family arranged for their daughter to have an illegal abortion. Savile was 38 years old when this happened. Neither the girl nor her parents thought it would have been appropriate to have contacted the police. Dance hall goers recall Savile disappearing with girls on many occasions usually to his car, either before he went on stage or after. He'd return 20 minutes to an hour later. Other witnesses recall groups of girls going to his flat day and night. Savile clearly didn't want relationships. With teenagers he could control and manipulate and then move on after he had had his way. It was all about the sex, nothing more. Anthony Clare, who interviewed Savile for his Radio 4 series, in The Psychiatrist's Chair, recalls some of the disturbing things Savile said. Savile showed many of the traits of being a psychopath. Robert Herr's checklist, devised to identify psychopaths, includes several traits we can associate with Savile slippery charm, a mask to conceal true self, low cunning and willingness to manipulate, absence of normal human emotions, lack of empathy, sexual promiscuity, inability to admit mistakes, fear of commitment, 
repeated attacks on the vulnerable. Do you think to have that many victims like Savile then, to be a large-scale psychopath like that, to have no feelings towards his victims... Have you looked at his life history to see if there's any, you know, nature versus nurture? I saw when he was a kid, something he banged his head, and he was, he, he couldn't close his eyes. He was like a little baby, and his eyes were open for like six right. months, and they thought he was going to die. Right. Um, the the thing where his his dad died from from cancer. Um, have, have you seen any factors in his life? Or? No, I mean, I think he had a very weird life. I mean, his mother was a dominance in his like, latter part of his life, and even when she died, he still kept his cupboard in the bedroom full of her clothes uh, i i think that that we never we will never know what was going on in that relationship with his mum but i think it would be fair to say and, and people will draw their own conclusion that it was unhealthy at best uh but it was really really wrong so but i don't know what else of course took place in his relationship are you saying there was a possibility of incest I leave that to people to make their own determination. There was no evidence. We never had any evidence that told us that. Uh, but I think his relationship with his mother was uh, was incredibly unhealthy uh, for a grown man of his age. Uh, I mean, he never cooked. He never had any utensils in his house or anything like that. He didn't have any food in thing. He, he, he's, he, he scrounged off everyone all the time. You know, he'd go to a local cafe and they'd, pay for, they'd give him food. He never used to pay for anything. I mean, he, he didn't own any of his Rolls Royces and things like that, or his cars. I mean, he never, I think he finished two marathons. All the other marathons, he got in a car and he got driven to the end. I mean, the man's just a complete liar. I mean, he'd say, he charged £3,000 to turn up at fate. He'd turn up for 10 minutes and then disappear. A con, a total and utter con. Working as a DJ in the 1960s, Savile often socialised with the police. Until the day he died... He maintained close relationships with several officers. In the early days, did he share the girls around? Were the police reluctant to pursue any allegations against Savile for fear of being brought into a prosecution? We will never know. What we do know is that Savile was a master manipulator. I imagine he would have delighted in corrupting and blackmailing individual police officers. How is it possible that West Yorkshire police, who governed Savile's hometown, didn't have a single shred of evidence against him? By law, they should have filed any allegations made against Savile anywhere in the country. The law requires that regional forces pass that information on to the local jurisdiction. After he was exposed and various inquiries conducted, the authorities learned that on five separate occasions serious allegations had been made in different jurisdictions. They should have been passed on to West Yorkshire Police. Surrey Police told one inquiry they had passed on allegations given to them as recently as 2008. In their own special inquiry, West Yorkshire Police, of course, denied receiving any such reports. If you allow the police to investigate themselves, what do you expect? This morning I woke up, let me think, uh, yeah, I was on my own, and that is tremendous. <laughs> How often do you wake up in the morning and have to check to see whether there is somebody on the other side? Well, <laughs> not very often because because what happens, I'm a pushover and, it, and if if somebody comes and knocks on the door and says, I, I've lost my keys to go in, I'll say, step this way. And they say, I thought you'd say that. <laughs> it's not my fault. I can't help it. I'm a single fella. There's nothing wrong with it. You haven't broken any laws, have you? None whatsoever. <laughs> One of the reports West Yorkshire Police should have had in their possession was a report by the Met Police that Savile was a regular visitor to a South London brothel. The police records from 1964 show that three men were charged with living off immoral earnings. What's notable is that absconders from Duncroft approved school used to stay in that house. Intelligence that could have been of huge importance 
decades later during the Surrey Police investigation in 2008. Had this information been seen by Surrey Police in 2008, surely it would have raised suspicions further. Maybe they would have detected a pattern of behaviour. Savile was clearly protected by his celebrity status. He must have felt untouchable. As the years went by, the longer he went undetected, he surely grew in confidence and was prepared to offend again and again, brazenly attacking his victims. Luckily for Savile, he managed to dodge a huge bullet in the 1960s. Media sources claim there was a newspaper investigation into his private life and specifically into his preference for underage girls. They had names and plenty of evidence. Unfortunately for hundreds of future victims, the very same newspaper decided to hire Savile as a columnist and the investigation was killed. The editor wanted to appeal to younger readers. Had this not been the case, Savile may have been exposed way back in 1967. Well, I went to stage school and I'd been there since I was five years of age. So during that time, I did films, adverts, modelling, television, plays, shows, um, over the years. And then I danced at school, I acted at school. We had limited education in the daytime. Um, and we went out for auditions uh, to get parts in films or adverts or modelling. And many times when I was out, other stage schools would be there as well, other children. Really the same mould, so if they, they were looking for a blonde with blue eyes, there would be lots of blondes with blue eyes. Um, and then eventually, when I was 14, 15, I used to go almost every week to Top of the Pops um, to dance there. Claire I first met when I was on an audition um, for an advert, along with many other children. I can't remember if I got it, or if Claire got it, or who got it. Too many years have passed for me to remember that very first audition. Um, and then I subsequently saw her uh, a few times. Um, again at auditions, and then we both got this audition and we did um, knitting patterns. And on the day of the uh, photographic session, we were working together and spent the day together and became friendly. And after that, when I used to see her on auditions, we'd always uh, chin wag with each other. And uh, we liked each other, and so we weren't rivals. We didn't feel we were rivals. I was hoping if I didn't get it, then Claire would, you know. Um, and then eventually I met her at Top of the Pops. She was a good dancer um, and she was very beautiful. That's one of the things that stood out about Claire. She's a very pretty girl. Um, and she was funny. She also had quite a serious side. Um, she kept a diary and she wrote down any of her experiences, even at auditions. I would often see her writing. Um, I don't know what she put always in the diary, but I figured it was what was happening to her at that given time. Um, but she was fun to be with. Yeah, a nice, a nice girl. Uh, if we'd lived near her, we would have most probably been even closer friends. Um, she told me she'd been adopted and that she did have a, another name. Um, so, those are little things that one shares with a friend. It was um, big in its day, Top of the Pops, which it was for another 15 years after we went there. Um, as for 
thinking it was a, a show to make us famous. No, I, I never went there on that. I went there most probably, in my mind, to be a dancer. And also, it's like being a, in a discotheque, really, when you're only 15. Um, you know you're not allowed into discotheques. So it was really almost the next best thing, you know. Um, but it wasn't there because there was famous people there, because throughout um, my time as a young actress, I'd met many famous people, so I was not in awe of them. And I don't think Claire would have been either. In fact, most probably lots of my friends who came with me to Top of the Pops, it was just some social fun after school. We just had to give our names and you got taken through to the Top of the Pops area. Um, obviously, we're not going to dance in our school uniform, so we were allocated an area to change. Um, some youngsters and certainly older people would arrive already in their day, evening wear, dance thing. But us as children, we arrived in uniform. Um, and so we changed into uh, hot pants or mini skirts or mini dresses high heels, uh, some makeup on. And because we were, in a way, um, professional dancers, we were often put in the front near the DJs or where the groups would be uh, singing. So there was a lot of older people there as well, as in 17, 18, 19, 20, dancing. But uh, we were sort of young school kids of 14, 15, and maybe 16, like that. We were always made to feel quite special. Um, some girls were invited back to dressing rooms. Um, I only went there once to a dressing room, and I can't remember which DJ's dressing room it was, but there was a few uh, people in the dressing room at the time drinking. Um, slightly what I might consider inappropriate behaviour with, with girls. I only had someone try it on with me once um, and I sort of smacked their, their hand down and um, I made excuses to go to the toilet and that was the only time I ever went into a Top of the Pops dressing room. I knew that what might be happening in there isn't what I wanted to happen to me. After Top of the Pops, uh, we were invited to go up to the bar. And again, names would be left as you approach the bar. So um, you could go into the BBC bar where there would be lots of executives. There would be actors from other uh, shows that have been or going on or being filmed at Top of the Pops. Um, on, at the BBC, and um, you know, we would be bought drinks, usually champagne. And I would only ever have a couple of glasses because I still had to travel home that evening, and I certainly wouldn't want my mother to um, see me drunk. So, a couple of glasses. There was there was one girl in particular um, who was sixteen, and she was promised um, some shows and fr on the Frankie Howard show actually at the time and she, um, she often went to the dressing room. So what she was propositioned, it may well have been to make her famous and she was in the Frankie, um, Frankie Howard show for a long time, one of his com comedy sketches, she was often in that. Um, myself, no. I saw him quite a few times. Sometimes him and another DJ would host Top of the Pops. It wasn't always just a singular DJ. Um, he was quite a touchy man. Um, and he would certainly pick who he might want to be near him. He would certainly say, you know, I'll have that girl come over here and dance near him and things like that. So um, he always looked a bit weird because of his colour of his hair. At times he had half black and half white hair. 
He dressed in tracksuit bottoms. Bit of a weirdo, but you know, he was he was very famous and he was a a charity fundraiser, so he had um, you know, everyone knew him and he was most probably the most famous of the DJs that did Top of the Pops. I had an opinion that he was the dirty old man, just by the touching he tended to do around the uh, groups that were near him. Um, he, he wasn't an ideal man to stand next to, let's put it that way, he was touchy-touchy. And as I say, the, um, the way that he was in his dressing room with others, that was sort of common knowledge, that he would be um, kissing, touching, uh, love biting one girl in particular. She often would show with love bites around her neck and breast area. Um, so he was a bit of a dirty old man. I mean, I never could really understand why any of the young girls, whether it be 15, 16 or 17, would like Jimmy Savile to put his hands or mouth over you anywhere. I can't imagine anything worse, really. He would actually ask the floor managers and they would come on the stage and whisper in girls' ears uh, to go back to a dressing room. And that could have been not only Jimmy Savile, that would have been other DJs as well at the time. Well, Claire was approached by a floor manager one evening. In fact, she was taken off stage and disappeared even before Top of the Pops was filmed. And uh, when she came back for the filming of Top of the Pops, she told me that she was going for a, a drink with one of the artists who was appearing on Top of the Pops that evening. And uh, she asked if she could stay at my place um, because her mother obviously would not be very happy that she was 15 years of age and leaving Top of the Pops. And instead of going home, she was going for a drink with uh, a famous singer. Um, and I said to her, yeah, you, of course you can stay. And um, after Top of the Pops, she phoned her mum and I spoke to Mrs. Cowpoint just to confirm that Claire would come back to my place and then she'll go on to school because she had a school uniform with her, obviously. And um, that's what I was expecting, that Claire would do that night. Um, and then following that show, I saw Claire go off, there's a tunnel near the Top of the Pops that the artists used to go out the back way. And she was with this famous singer and she disappeared down the tunnel with him. Um, and I was waiting for her to come back to my place by 10 or 11 o'clock and she never turned up. Um, and by the next morning she wasn't there, I just assumed she must have gone home. Um, it wasn't for another couple of weeks before I saw her again that I found out what had happened to her that evening. So I gave her that alibi, not knowing I was actually giving her an alibi, because I did think she'd come to my place. And it's only when she wasn't there during the night, I just thought, I wonder if she's gone home. When I saw her, she um, was very keen to tell me what had happened. She had been taken to um, South Kensington, to a hotel in South Kensington, and had gone into the bar with this singer, and they'd had a drink. He then said he wanted to change out of his outfit that he had worn at Top of the Pops, and for her to come up to his suite, which she did. And from there, she was given more alcohol, um, dinner, and she ended up staying the night with this famous singer. And, and from what she told me, she had sex with him. Now, I don't know if Claire had ever had sex before. I don't know if she was a virgin, um, but she had spent the night with him and he sent her home in a taxi um, all, 
or to school, I'm not sure, the next morning. She put a uniform on and I think went to school. Well, I think she had found when she was turning up at some DJ's places that she had got herself in a bit deep um, and didn't really know how to get how, how to get out of it. Um, and I told her then, you know, just don't go there. Um, but I, I think she's found that she was already on a spiral of being obliged to meet these people. And then a few weeks on, she was very worried. Uh, I know she had missed her period and she was very worried that she might be pregnant. Meanwhile, her mum had found her diary. Um, when I spoke to her on the phone, not, I didn't see her face to face, but I spoke to her on the phone and uh, she was really upset that her mum now was taking matters further, that they were going to go, she was going to go to the BBC and subsequently she went to the police. And I think Claire was embarrassed that things were coming out with what she'd been doing. I do think she had a pregnancy fear at that time. And the next thing I knew, she had committed suicide. Um, and then it was in the news of the world the following week with the exploits of this girl and her diary. Very sad. Claire McAlpine's body was discovered by her mother, lying on the floor beside an empty bottle of sleeping pills and a red diary. She was only 15 years old. The diary revealed how she had been sleeping with DJs she had met at Top of the Pops. One had given her drugs. After the, the incident with the pop star, I only saw her for only to look at one more time. And then a couple of phone calls um, of, of chatting. But she was worried. She was, I think she was worried that it would all come out, what was in her diary. But I also think she was quite worried that she might be pregnant. So that was maybe even more on her mind if that had happened. Um, she never had gone for the test, but she died during that, that time that she was feeling very vulnerable. Um, and also what her mother was going to do. You know, her mum had already gone to the BBC. I remember that. I don't know if at the time her mum went to the police at the same time or if that was after her death. I'm not sure. The diary's contents had shocked Claire's mother, Vera, who had discovered it a month before Claire had taken her own life. The News of the World reported on the story, quoting Vera as saying, Some of the passages were so shocking that I would rather not repeat them. But the police know what they said. Vera contacted both the BBC and the police. When she contacted the BBC, she demanded to speak to someone in a senior position. Only to be told that would be impossible. The BBC shrugged off the whole matter, despite the fact that Claire had been a regular participant on the show. They claimed to have spoken to the DJ in question, who had denied the allegations. Case closed. Neither Claire nor Vera were contacted for their side of the story. She felt embarrassed that she had been to people's homes and had been to this hotel. I think it was more out of embarrassment that uh, her school, her friends would all be aware that she was doing a little bit more than just going and dancing on top of the pops. It was my mother that saw me next to Claire or just um, on, on the paper, on the News of the World, 
and my mother marched up to my bedroom and demanded what had I been doing at Top of the Pops. Um, so I got into a big squabble with my mother that, and I was banned then from going to Top of the Pops. Um, so I, I didn't see Claire, but we spoke and, um, and then as I say, when it all came out about her death and what subsequently had been happening at Top of the Pops that, you know, eventually was told that it was all fantasy in her mind that this book, this diary that she wrote this, these things in was all made up. I don't believe they were made up. Um, and, and it's a shame some other people didn't believe her. I think her mother believed her, what was in the diary. Hence why she wanted to, you know, take the BBC to say, why, are, why is it this happening to 14, 15 year old girls? Why are they going back to DJ's houses? And why are they going to DJ's um, dressing rooms? And why are they going to the BBC bar? At the inquest into Claire's death, officials had branded her as a fantasist. Her diary ended up at Scotland Yard. We will never be able to check its contents as conveniently it went missing. Claire's half-brother Mark claims that Saville was one of the DJs named in the diary. Former BBC DJ Tony Blackburn denies ever meeting Claire. Well, it was with the Tony Blackburn sacking of him um, saying that he had never met Claire or didn't know of her, when I'm aware he certainly did meet her. Um, so he was sacked from the BBC. And I just put a comment online regarding that rightly so he should be sacked. Um, and then some journalists found that comment and followed it up. And then the next thing I was approached with was the original paper, the news cutting that I and Claire were in, um, showing us with Jimmy Savile on stage at Top of the Pops. And this was in the news of the world, obviously. Um, so I just made a sort of sarky comment. It's about sort of time they took him out of the BBC, um, which within a year he was back doing a Saturday show. And so they don't let them go that far. If you're in with the BBC, I think you've got a job there for life by the looks of it. Well, it's 50 years ago and it will always be a sad feeling to know that girl never went on to a great life, not whether she would have been a dancer or an actress, but lost all the things that I gained, as in marriage, family, grandchildren. Um, and also that really she was deemed a liar, a fantasist, and the perpetrators of not only Claire have gone on to continue, as in Jimmy Savile's case, um, for many years. Maybe if they had just listened to what she had said or believed her, given her the chance. One, obviously, when her back was against the wall, no one was believing her, you know, she committed suicide. And obviously with her mother on her case, and as I say, rightly so, um, it's a shame. So angry, angry that she was overlooked, swept aside, yes, but more sad that um, she couldn't have become the woman she could have been. Mm. In May 2010, it was brought to the attention of senior BBC executives that Savile was gravely sick. Nick Vaughan Barrett emailed George Entwessel to reveal that the BBC did not have a ready-made obituary. The end of the email said, I'm not sure we would want one. I have a personal interest here. My first job in TV was on a Jimmy Savile show. I know him well. 
and saw the complex and sometimes conflicting nature of the man at first hand. I'd feel very queasy about an obituary. I saw the real truth. So what was the real truth? Why didn't Nick speak up? This is a typical example of someone in an institution who may have seen Savile's crimes firsthand and simply turned a blind eye. How many other people saw Jimmy Savile offend and chose to do nothing? He sexually abused people for five decades, primarily in institutions. When he abused at hospitals, it was usually in public spaces. How many witnessed the abuse? How many fundraisers at charity events or production staff on TV shows saw crimes take place that they just kept quiet about? Senior BBC executives were well aware of the dark side of Savile while he was still alive. I was going to Interpol in around 2011, probably, to do a piece for BBC Newsnight on the um, images of uh, child abuse images of what Interpol were doing to try and identify offenders. And it was on the way either back or there where my producer said to me, have you ever heard anything about Savile being a paedophile? And I went, no, I said, he's a weirdo. <laughs> I said, I wouldn't want any, wouldn't want to spend any time with the bloke. But no, I've never heard that. He said, well, that's really interesting because a police force, either Surrey or Sussex, did investigate him for uh, child abuse. And we're unsure what happened with that or where it went. And I said, that's really strange. I said, I've not heard that. I said, it can't have happened whilst I was in the force because I would have known about it. I said, so it must have happened after I left. And I'm surprised if it happened in Surrey because I haven't heard about it. I said, but I'll make some inquiries and and see what I can find out. What did you find out? Well, so I then made some inquiries and established that actually Surrey Police had investigated him. Uh, I obviously have got some very good contacts in police forces and and especially within Surrey because I was an ex-Surrey officer. And they told me, yeah, we did investigate him. Uh, The officer that told me, was a very senior officer and he said look i can't remember what the outcome of it was uh, but suffice to say that we'd investigate him and the matter didn't go any further forward i then went back and told the producer this Uh, and this is where it all then snowballs because he then talks to his editor and his editor basically said to him well that doesn't look to me like it's a story so the story they were after was incompetence by police failed to do an investigation or failed to follow it up and he came back and said well the, the, the editor's not really that interested in it. It's not a story in terms of... And I said, I think you're missing the point. The story is, surely, that he's been interviewed in relation to child abuse and that, therefore, there's an allegation in relation to child sexual offences against such a status of an individual. Uh, but they didn't run with it. And then I remember talking to him and said to him, he said to me, look, it's dead. We, we can't do anything with it. And I said, well, if you're happy, let me run with it. I said, you know, I'm on a different network. You're on BBC. My relationship is with ITV. Let me run with it and see what I do. It still needed a lot of work. So those people out there have said, you know, I literally followed on with what the BBC had. That's absolutely not the case. What we had to do after that was really build the story. There were some elements in place, but probably nothing more than 10% in place. We then had to build everything else up. And crucially, and it was really important is that the allegations that the BBC were looking at related to a Duncroft, which was a children's home in Surrey, earlier than that in the Metropolitan Police area. And we, I was very clear that I said, you know, we need to find victims away from Duncroft. And quite simply it was, is that it's very easy for the public to be critical of people who are in approved homes, who are in social services care. What we needed to do is get people away from that environment where who were much more likely, wrongly, but much more likely to be believed in the first instance. And then we can build that up and bring in the Duncroft girls as well to show the totality of what was taking place. And it was a it was a good year's work. What were the biggest hoops? Just getting on air. I mean, it was just incredibly difficult getting people to to believe you, getting people to to take that. I mean, this what we were about to out kind of the biggest status person in British television 
that there'd been and and that was momentum so it was a huge thing for the BB, for ITV to do massive thing and there was a lot of public anger towards it you know even in the days leading up to the program's broadcast i remember we did a bbc leeds did a phone in thanks for watching our podcast this is a word from our sponsor shopify i feel like i'm missing out because everyone is starting a side hustle or their own business these days and you know what they're hearing a lot that's the sound of another sale on shopify the all-in-one commerce platform to start run and grow your business Shopify is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. Whether you're selling books or events like us, Shopify simplifies selling online and in person so you can successfully grow your business. Shopify covers all your sales channels from a shopfront ready POS system to its all in one e commerce platform. Shopify even gets you selling across social media marketplaces like Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Full of the industry-leading tools ready to ignite your growth, Shopify gives you complete control over your business and your brand without learning new skills in design or coding. And thanks to 24-7 help and with an extensive business course library, Shopify is ready to support your success every step of the way. Look, there's so many options out there to expand your business these days. And what's lovely about Shopify is that no matter how big you want to grow, Shopify will be there to empower you with the confidence and control to take your business to the next level. It's time to get serious about selling and get Shopify today. This is Possibility, powered by Shopify. Sign up for a £1 per month trial period at shopify.co.uk forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N, all lowercase. Go to shopify.co.uk slash Sean to take your business to the next level today. Shopify.co.uk forward slash Sean. That's the word from our sponsor. Thanks for watching. Link in description. Back to the podcast. And during that phone in, they were criticizing me, basically saying, this guy, Mark William Summers, who the hell does he think he is? Expo you know, thinking that he can expose this guy. He's done so much for charity. This guy is such a good, he's not here to defend himself. And, uh, and I remember listening to it and I listened to it because I wanted to hear if there was any one that phoned up and said anything like he abused me and try and get hold of them. Anyway, nobody did. I got quite a lot of grief. And I remember they were trying to phone me all morning. We come on when he come on. And I said to my agent, I'm not going on at all. I just, why would I go on to, to listen to that? Um, and, and then obviously the, the program goes out or so the news, the program goes out on the Thursday, but on the Sunday, the articles start. And it was quite interesting how the media shifted. So you could see from the Sunday to the Tuesday by Tuesday, the media were all on my side. They'd start to find victims themselves. They were believing the story. And and it then became a very much a, uh, a momentum. I mean, I, the program went out and I withdrew myself from the media for two weeks. I, I, and the reason I did that is because I didn't want the story to be about me. It was never about me. It was about the victims. I, I was the vehicle for the story. I was the person that, that, that did the investigation and made it happen. But it wasn't me. You know, whenever anybody is prosecuted you know when um the west were caught you know it wasn't about the senior investigating officer it was about the catching of of him and that's what i wanted savile to be about the bbc had the chance to expose savile long before itv went ahead and did so with the exposure documentary less than three weeks after savile died a journalist from the BBC Newsnight team began working on a script. It read, When Jimmy Savile died in October, Prince Charles led the tribute to a national treasure. But there was a darker side to the star of Jim'll Fix It. Newsnight has learned that he was investigated by police for sexual assaults on minors, but the Crown Prosecution Service decided that he was too old and infirm to face trial. Now, some of the girls, who say they were assaulted by him when they were 13, 14 and 15, have talked to Newsnight. They say Savile was an evil man, who should rot in hell, and that his charity work gave him cover to get young girls. They even claim some of his abuse took place after BBC recordings, and involved other celebrity paedophiles, who appeared on Savile's shows such as Gary Glitter. 
So the story behind the making of the program was that essentially we'd got to a position where the program was ready to go. And on the Saturday, so on the Friday, we'd agreed a process in terms of giving some information to the newspapers. So what the uh, ITV publicity desk said, let's give it to the Mail on Sunday as an exclusive, and then we'll give the extra bits to some of the other newspapers. And I have a very good relationship with the Sunday Mirror. So I said, well, I'd like to give some to the Sunday Mirror because they're a very good paper and I know the editor very well. And they said, okay, well, why don't you do a personal interview for the Mail on Sunday and we'll give everything else to the Sunday Mirror. And so I said, okay, it's fine. And I remember on Saturday, I got a phone call from, I was at my son's football match and I got a phone call from the reporter from the mail on sunday and they said well, we're just finalizing this report for tomorrow can you just tell me a little bit more so i told them and they said well isn't there any more and i went no there isn't that's the story i said what well, you want more and they went well it's not really big enough and it's not this and i went right so i thought okay and so sunday comes and the sunday mirror and the sunday sunday people run the savile story on the front page the Mail on Sunday runs it on page five or something like that. And and I'll never forget that because I think that's a really significant moment in terms of, of not understanding the, the gravity of the story. That story then ran on the front pages for a consecutive 41 days, the Jimmy Savile story. So that tells you how massive this was, not just in terms of, of the UK, but internationally and worldwide. And the the aspects in terms of, of the BBC then became a big story because, of course, when we were making the program, we wrote, as we would do, to a right to reply. We wrote to the director general at the time and said, can we have an interview in relation to the allegations we've got and the information we've got? And the director general refused to give us an interview and said no. So, And actually, furthermore, went on and said, we basically, we don't know anything about this and just dismissed it out of hand. Now, that was their first massive failing because what they should have done, and this is a massive learn for any organization that's facing these problems, is they should have said, listen, you know, this is not on my watch. It's happened a long time ago. We take these allegations really seriously. We will now launch an investigation to find out what's gone on. That's what they should have said, but they didn't. They buried their head. They came up with a very arrogant attitude. And actually then that manifests itself and just became worse because what you ended up with was the BBC then having to almost go full circle and, and then kind of some kind of acceptance to a level. Uh, but the, the problem with the BBC is that it's level, it, it has levels of middle management and high management. Uh, and often the people with the information are the, the troops on the ground. All right. And so and it applies to all organizations, but but the BBC is particularly large. So you have the, the troops, I would call them on the ground. These are the people that have the information, know what's going on and are able to tell you as a as the boss what you should know. But what happened is that the senior management and the middle management failed to engage with the troops on the ground. So they were dealing with what they wanted to deal with and what they thought that they knew without knowing the information. And therefore, as a result of that, their arrogance was that they came out and gave certain information, which, of course, was wrong and not true. Uh, so that's where it failed. I think if you look back on the Savile investigation, if you worked in risk management and crisis communication, that is the example of how not to do it. Is there a scramble to protect the mothership when something like this happens? There always is. You know, look at baby Peter. You know, the 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 chief um, head of children's services came out and said, we've done nothing wrong. You know, this is the biggest problem with organisations is that when you get something wrong, hold your hand up. We failed. We need to do it better. We will properly investigate what's gone on and we'll find out and we'll get to the bottom of this. When you come out with the arrogance and say, actually, do you know what? We didn't do anything wrong. It's, it, it, it will fall back on you. You will end up in time wishing you'd never said that. And that's, that's shown and repeated itself over and over and over again. And the BBC exactly the same. You know, as a result of my investigation and my program and the impact of what it caused, the director general resigned. You know, I think as far as, as moments in time, you know, my program was a massive moment in time, but there are two other moments which I think are probably the biggest moments in time, which is one, the director general re resigning, 
and Jimmy Savile's headstone being removed. You know, those two moments for me, I remember where, where I was on both occasions. One occasion I was on the tube and the other occasion I was coming back from an interview on the train. I remember them saying the director general's resigned and, and it was like, this is just incredible. And actually, he didn't need to resign if he'd have taken the proper advice and he had dealt with it properly. He wasn't in post when all this went on. But what he was able to do is to deal with it and give some kind of reassurance that the BBC were taking this seriously. That didn't come across. Why was the show pulled? The Newsnight team could have broken the Savile story, but they didn't. They had several testimonies. They had found clear and compelling evidence that Savile was a paedophile. The Newsnight journalists had a duty to report the story, and they wanted to. Liz McKean and Marion Jones wanted to run the story, but the higher-ups didn't. Some say they felt it would ruin their plans for Shane Rich's Jim Will Fix It tribute show planned for Christmas that year. Instead, the BBC turned another blind eye to Savile's offending and axed the Newsnight investigation. Was it to save their reputation? Was it to save the Shane Ritchie Christmas special? The official line from the BBC is that Newsnight editors felt there wasn't a strong enough story. The CPS had decided to prosecute so there was no story. Liz McKean, the journalist working on the Newsnight report, was furious with the decision to pull the programme. The BBC immediately began lying suggesting the story was about the CPS and we'd not stood it up and not about the thing it was about. It was obvious that it would eventually come out for no other reason then. Others would come forward. We knew that Mark Williams Thomas was going to take it elsewhere with our blessing because this was a story that needed to be told. Nick Cohen interviewed Liz McKean for The Observer in 2015. There is a small group of powerful people at the BBC who think it would have been better if the truth about Savile had never come out, and they aim to punish the reporters who revealed it. When the Savile story broke, the BBC tried to smear my reputation. They said they had banned the film because Merion and I had produced shoddy journalism. I stayed to fight them, but I knew they would make me leave in the end. McKean quit the BBC. Marion Jones was sacked. Like West Yorkshire Police, the BBC held their own inquiry into their conduct regarding Savile. Unsurprisingly, no one has ever been held to account for failing to report Savile's crimes. Savile was a danger to young people, both girls and boys, opportunistic and shameless. I have identified 72 BBC victims of Savile, of whom 34 were under the age of 16. His youngest victim was aged eight. His abuse included eight cases of rape, the youngest victim being only 10 years old. Uh, there are still people in the BBC, there's still people in, in television worldwide uh, and in the media who hate me for what I've done, who dislike me because I've exposed Jimmy Savile and subsequently exposed Max Clifford, Rolf Harris and other people. You know, I can't... That's their inability to deal with things. That's their failings. All I can do is hold myself true to what I believe I've done and what I believe was the right thing. And I know that exposing Savile not only had a huge impact on me physically and mentally, because it was a massive thing to do, but it was the right thing to do. And I know that I have saved hundreds, if not thousands of people from either continued trauma or being abused. There was a culture of not complaining or of raising concerns. BBC staff felt and were sometimes told that it was not in their best interests to pursue a complaint. 
Loyalty to and pride in a program could hinder the sharing of concerns. There was a reluctance to rock the boat. But this report does. Some of the details are shocking. One victim was told, keep your mouth shut, he's a VIP. That even with plenty of material out in the public eye which cast doubt over Jimmy Savile's character, BBC bosses didn't think to remove him from his position of unfettered access to vulnerable young people. In 2016, Tony Blackburn, former DJ at the BBC, was fired due to evidence he'd given at the inquiry into allegations of sexual abuse. The former DJ was sacked due to inconsistencies he had given in the inquiry. I don't know if you remember an interview years ago with um, John Lydon. Oh, Johnny Rotten. Yeah, Johnny Rotten. He, he gave an interview. It about 1978, he was banned from the BBC because he outed Jimmy Savile. They won't put him on top of the pops. Exactly. Now, if Johnny Rotten knows, I mean, he's an intelligent man. I mean, don't get me wrong, but if Johnny Rotten knows and spilling the beans, you know, if David Icke's spilling the beans, that tells you something. You know, he's... he's there's a major cover-ups going from the royal family right the way down to the CPS. They hide it. We're the taxpayers. We're the license payers. And for years, we've been conned and snowed by the BBC. We have cover sexual cover-ups from top to bottom. How disgusting is that? And the BBC knew about it and they condoned it. And not one person, Sean, has been held responsible. In fact, they've been promoted. They're given pensions. The BBC needs to get its ass into gear. So how complicit were the BBC in enabling him? Right, I'm, I'm going to be totally honest here. I've got stacks of notes which I'm I'm always making notes when I'm indoors you know I've got my purple pen out and I'm forever writing and it was in 1999 that a guy called Sir Roger Jones decided that Jimmy Savile shall not have entrance to the BBC ever again he was questioned on um, a program by Mark Williams Thomas the ex-detective yeah we've got him on this documentary yeah um and Mark Williams Thomas asked him the question, did you know at the time? He didn't give a straight answer. But for him to turn around and in 1999 turn around and say, no, we don't want Savile in here, that tells you something straight away. Then we go back to children in need. The reason I bring up children in need is because someone in the BBC wanted Savile on children in need. And the hierarchy at the BBC said no. We can't have them in charge of children in need. Never gave a reason. You know, turned around and said, no, we just can't have him. Esther Anson said, and she quoted on a couple of occasions, in a funny way, we colluded with him. Now, when you have Mark Williams, Thomas on, on he will tell you that. What's a funny way about we colluded him. Why would you turn around and say in a funny way, you know, it sounds like you did collude with him. You knew what was going on. A couple of years later, she's starting up Childline. She said it's very painful and distressing. For who? For the people that are involved or because you knew what was going on. We've made him into the Jimmy Savile who was untouchable. Now, there's three quotes there that Esther's come out with that tell me that she knew what was going on. Her husband, Desmond Wilcox, who was a filmmaker at the time, uh, but was also in charge of the BBC, her husband. It, the clues are there. In a funny sort of way, we colluded with them. If I said to you, in a funny sort of way, I colluded with you, you go, up. Uh, it makes you sort of 
But Christopher said, you, you could be, you feel as though you're involved. Yeah, because, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, if you're young, you're vulnerable, okay? If, you, if you're a 14-year-old girl or 16-year-old girl going to the top of the pops and you're standing next to the white-haired um, uh, face of the BBC who, who's who's probably, you know, been and done, done it all and you're thinking, hey, if I get in with him, you know, I mean, he's going to make me a star, you know, I'm, I'm going to end up making a lot of money and... In reality, you're going to end up making sod all because all this guy wants you for is a quick fling and a fiddle, get you out of the door, and if you say anything, I'm going to ruin your life. He said he's going to ruin your... I mean, the amount of times he said it to people, I'm going to ruin your life. As Savile got older, his allure as a celebrity DJ started to fade. No longer did groupies swarm around him as they had done during his Manchester Mecca dance hall days. So did Savile turn to hospital patients, finding them a captive audience with plenty of vulnerable victims? 40 years ago, June Thornton was a patient at Leeds General Infirmary. She says she saw the TV and radio star molest a brain damaged girl, a memory that has haunted her. Jimmy Savile come to a young lady sat in a chair. Unfortunately, this lady, I think, had brain damage because she just sat there and he kissed her and I thought he was a visitor coming to see her and he started rubbing his hands down her arms and then I don't know of a nice way to put it but he molested her he helped himself and she just sat there and couldn't do anything about it and I've lived with that now for 40 years he volunteered at Leeds General Infirmary in Stoke Mandeville he was also heavily involved in Broadmoor and to a lesser degree at Rampton in Nottinghamshire so we did some work around Broadmoor in the second series, second programme we did, which was the uh, Savile Update. And part of that, we interviewed Edwina Curry, who I've got to know really well now. She's, she's very nice. And she was, um, she was one of the ministers there. And she gave the responsibility to Savile to be chair of this task force to go in and look at Broadmoor and to see whether or not it needed improvement. And Broadmoor was that mentally ill people and so, prisoners? So, yeah, so Broadmoor is one of the top security prisons. It's a mental mental prison. Uh, it's a hospital in essence, really. It's a hospital. But the most dangerous are there. So the Craze, Peter Sutcliffe, uh, yeah, the most dangerous people in society who are in essence untreatable are in Broadmoor or one of the other uh, institutions around that. So they give a set of keys to Savile in order to be on this task force. Now, what Edwina told Edwina Curry told us is that she was aware that he was using his power and influence around his role there, and that might be to the degree that he would find out about staff certain doing certain things, and then he would have power and control over them, so they wouldn't say anything. But we interviewed uh, witnesses, victims from there who'd been in the care system in terms of being in in uh, Broadmoor. And there's one lady that gave us an account, which was truly horrific. So in those days, the female ward would have bars, kind of like old dormitories, uh, uh, private schools. So the bars would be alongside each other. And she was taking a bath one day and she remembers having this bath. And Savile just stood in the background, just wandering around between the girls. And she talks about one occasion when he then took her into a one of the rooms and indecently assaulted her. But Savile had free reign around there. I mean, we interviewed Alan Franey, who was the general manager there at the time, who was appointed, appointed as a direct result of Savile. So Savile took this task force role and they wanted a new general manager. And Franey, who had no experience in the mental health system, no experience in the prison system, he'd come from hospital and was simply a friend of... Uh, Savills was a, given this post 
And then Savile take he comes into post and Savile's actually already there. And I remember interviewing Franey and said to him, so what role did you give him? And he said, well, he already had a role at the place. And I said, yeah, well, well what role was that? He said, well, uh, assistant entertainment's manager. I said, well, what did that involve? And he went, well, I'm not really sure. I said, you're the general manager. You're the boss. How did you not know what this bloke was doing? I said he had a set of keys. He said, well, yeah, he only had a set of keys. He didn't have a set of keys to bedrooms. I said he had a set of keys to everywhere. He might not have been the room, the bedrooms, but he had a set of keys to, to go wherever he wanted. Well, I mean, we heard some horrific stories about what he did there. There is no doubt that he preyed on those individuals within the prison set prison network at Broadmoor. He had a free reign. I mean, there was staff that called us who were there at the time, who hated him, hated him with a vengeance because he effectively thought that he was the boss. He could come and go. He could do what he wanted. He ignored things. I mean, the keys, for example, you had to hang the keys up at the end of every shift. He didn't. He took the keys with him. You know, protocol broken all the time. So he got away with that. Working at these institutions had many benefits for Savile. Not only would he have access to new victims, the publicity would boost his fame and cast him in a favourable light, throwing people off the scent. And then, what work was he doing at Leeds General Hospital? There was a guy called Franey, who was a good friend of Jimmy Savile's, who was in charge of Leeds General Hospital. And what Franey done was, um, Jimmy, you know, got involved with Franey, and, and, and what eventually happened was that he, he made his way to Leeds Hospital put himself forward for volunteering as a porter. Now, the first early recorded case that Savile was involved in was in 1955, just before he went to Leeds General Hospital. So he's in the um, Leeds General, he's put himself forward for the porter's role. He's then not only doing the porter's role, he's doing the radio at the hospital as well. So he, he's getting himself well known in two different areas there. He's making himself out to be something. You know, he's trying, he's, he's spreading the word. but And then it becomes tricky. You, you know what I mean? This is where they, in 1957 they say that some of the Leeds General Hospital stuff started. In 1977, a 12-year-old girl went into Stoke Mandeville Hospital to have her tonsils removed. For some reason, she was put on a geriatric ward, separated from other children. In a disclosure taken during Operation Utri, the women described how she had become bored and wandered off the ward where she had encountered Savile, who was volunteering as a porter. He began chatting to the girl and soon led her off into an empty TV room where he raped her. He left the girl in the TV room. She recalls being in shock and unable to understand what had happened. When she returned to the ward, she encountered a nurse and told her, your porter just hurt me. The nurse asked where and the girl, unsure of what to say, simply pointed to the area of her vagina. The nurse responded, don't say anything, I'll get in trouble. The woman recalled returning to her bed, confused, but she knew what had happened was wrong. She wrote down a message to the doctor, your porter hurt me, please ring my dad. She added her address and telephone number and signed the paper. She then posted the paper into a red letterbox in a corridor. She believed the paper would go to the doctors at the hospital. Later that night, Savile returned to the girl's bed and sexually assaulted her again. When the second attack ended, the girl said she witnessed Savile walk over to the bed of an elderly patient and then proceed to jump on top of her, lying face down. As he did, the girl heard a nurse shout out, You shouldn't be in here, Jimmy. The girl saw Savile get off the lady and leave the ward. 
The next day she wrote another letter to report the attacks and again she posted it in the same letterbox. Years later, watching TV, the girl recognised her attacker. She couldn't understand why the porter from the hospital was on TV. Here is a word from today's sponsor, Aura. If you Google someone, you can find out all kinds of personal information about them. This information is accessible because of data brokers who profit by selling your information to robocallers, telemarketers, spammers. You can use my link, https dot dot forward slash forward slash aura dot com. Aura is A-U-R-A forward slash Sean Atwood, S-H-A-U-N-A-T-T Wood to try two weeks for free and see how many data brokers are sharing your info. Also linked in my description box on this YouTube version or scan the QR code on the screen. Aura also monitors your emails and passwords to see if they were involved in a data breach and exposed on the dark web and gives you the recommendations on what to do. Aura has almost every internet safety tool you'll ever need all inside one app. It's shocking that Savile attacked his victims so brazenly. It's also disturbing that his behaviour was known to staff. How many hospital workers witnessed Jimmy Savile abusing patients? How many knew of his dark side? The fact that they said nothing and turned a blind eye is despicable. Savile had total run of Broadmoor Hospital. He had a house on the, um, just outside the walls. He had his own caravan inside the walls. He could come and go as he pleased. What went on in those mortuaries, I probably can only leave to the imagination of people that read horror stories. But then you've got Leeds General, Papworth Hospital, Stoke Mandeville Hospital, where he had his own room, and he called it the kennel. He had the run of the whole hospital. Oh, here's Jimmy, you know what I mean? Oh, where's he? oh, don't worry about it, it's Jimmy, just let him get on with it. After Savile was outed, Stoke Mandeville denied knowing about any allegations about the DJ. There was one 14-year-old at Broadmoor that went squealing, was well, squealing rightfully so, to the warders and nurses that was told to, as Jimmy Savile, forget about it. There were eight cases at Broadmoor in total. There were 40 hospitals that this guy managed to get into from children's hospitals. There are numerous, numerous accounts of how he could have been caught. And to top it off, his, home, his, own, his own barrister turned around and said to uh, the Mirror newspaper, well, we know he did it. That is his own barrister that was going to defend him in one case because the mirror outed him a long time before he died and they were told to drop it because it's Jimmy Savile, you won't get it, you know. And his own barrister turned around and said, we can't touch him. We know he did it, but we can't touch him. Part of the reason Savile got away with it was because he was such a master manipulator. He was a fixer of things who groomed whole institutions, worming his way in with staff from top to bottom, from managers and chairmen to lowly porters. He helped people get top jobs and promotions. He bought staff presents and allowed them to take holidays in his caravan. What was Edwina Curry's role in all this? Oh. Funny story, me and Christopher had a chat on the way up in the car and he met Edwina Curry on a couple of occasions and turned around and told me a few stories about her. Um, quite aloof. I won't use the words, but... Anyway, Edwina Curry was in charge of um, Department of Health because, bear in mind, Broadmoor did not have... Uh, didn't come apart a part of the NHS until 2002. It was under the Department of Health. Edwina Curry, in uh, in those years, 
had encouraged um, the people at Bournemouth that Savile should be in charge. This is a lady who's running, helped running the country, and she's now put a lunatic inside of, in charge of an asylum. He's got a set of gold keys. He comes and goes as he pleases. He has a massive palatial caravan in the grounds. He gets his gold-plated um, Rolls Royce service by the mechanics there. Not just that, his Hustler mobile home, it's called the Hustler, serviced at Broadmoor, all under the noses of everyone. And Edwina Curry, blindsided, as well as Thatcher, blindsided by this utter loon and psychopath to run a psychiatric hospital. It's, it's, you could say, it's, you know, it's another one of his sweet shops. Because that's the impression I get. Savile only used these as, as sweet shops. And you've got to remember, they hop from Broadmoor, then they pop up to Patworth. Then they go over to Stoke Mandeville. Then they go down to Bristol. They pop up to Liverpool or Manchester. There's 40 hospitals that this man had been known to tour around and have his way. Savile got his way no matter what. Nobody dare stand in his way. He was sometimes called the Godfather. At one time, he was probably the most well-connected man in Britain. Having useful connections in media, health, politics and royal circles. People knew about his powerful connections and were probably reminded about this if they challenged him. If he could get someone hired to the top job at Broadmoor, how easy would it have been to get someone sacked from a low position? He was on the government task force to restructure Broadmoor. He had the keys to the whole place. He bragged he ran the hospital. He bragged to police officers in 2008 that he owned Stoke Mandeville Hospital. If staff weren't on side with Jimmy, then they were wary of him and would tolerate his behavior for fear of reprisals. Reports from health institutions in the wake of the scandal accepted that perceptions of his power and influence were a powerful incentive to discourage complaints. Savile raised millions for Stoke Mandeville Hospital in Buckinghamshire, but here too stories are emerging of nurses telling children to pretend to be asleep to avoid his attentions. The trust that runs Stoke Mandeville today said it was shocked by the allegations and was supporting the police investigation. When the reports came in, there were 60 allegations of abuse at Leeds General Infirmary, 11 at Stoke Mandeville and 10 at Broadmoor. The crimes at health institutions took place between 1962 and 2009, with victims aged between 5 to 75 years old. In Leeds, there were three cases of rape. Surprisingly, most of the offences occurred in public places. It's simply unbelievable that all this abuse went on, on that scale over decades, and no one saw a thing. What Freedom of Information Acts have you tried to utilise to get information on Savile and Broadmoor? Well, we already knew the answers, Boris and I. But I thought, well, let's give Broadmoor or the NHS a fair crack at the whip. We, we knew what the answers were. So I sent Broadmoor a FOI request. Now, by law, they should have responded to say they got it within 12 days. A maximum. Got about a month or so to come back and say, we can either help you or we can't help you or there will be a fee. Th this is the FOI cross. This is, this is British government law. Not a peep. I ra redid it again after two months. Nothing. I rang the hospital. Nobody wouldn't answer. And eventually I got hold of a security guard who gave me a telephone number. 
Yes, sir, I think I've got somebody for you. I spoke to this woman. She said, I'll pass that on to our legal advisors. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you very much for contact. We'll do everything we can to help you. Nothing. Eventually, I, on my third FOI request, I, I actually sent a copy to uh, Matt Hancock, um, the health secretary, because this is this was this this refusal to answer these things. It is under his watch. Nothing. But the next day, the NHS attorneys emailed me. Oh well, we're not part of the NHS as such. That hospital, we are. It is the NHS, and we uh, we are NHS. And then I wrote back and said, well, that's legal bullshit because, you know, are you telling me that Broadmoor Hospital is not a public institution and they're not responsible for the freedom of information? And I come back with another little bullshit. And we already knew the answers. <laughs> so you see the cover-up constantly covering up. How many nurses had told their managers about Savile's behaviour and were told to shut up. In the 1970s, a nurse did in fact contact Thames Valley Police to inform them of Savile's inappropriate behaviour at Stoke Mandeville. She told a detective that staff at the hospital were unhappy with Savile. The detective then took the complaint to a senior officer who brushed it away. Jimmy was too high profile. One victim who had been assaulted recalled trying to tell a group of nurses about being molested by Savile just moments after the attack took place. As soon as she mentioned his name, the nurses laughed and walked away. Savile acted with impunity and he knew it. But he was almost at will to walk round and touch, sexually assault the females within there with any reper without any repercussions because no, none of those people would ever be believed because, of course, they were there because they were incarcerated. So their voice was never heard. So Savile had total free reign. And there was one girl we interviewed. And the impact on her when she gave us her account uh, had changed her life. You know, she changed her life. She, she gave one account when she was quite young. She went there, I think, about 19, something like that. And she gave us an account when she was on her period and she she didn't really know what she was doing. It was quite an early, she was in a very distressed state. And Savile just stood there, watched her, and then later they indecently assaulted her. And, he, and the way she gave us the account was just like, it, it, there was no sense of, of care in any way at all. He literally didn't care. And in terms of, access to mortuaries now we do know that he spent a lot of time or quite a bit of time particularly in the hospital in, in leeds i think it was uh, being a, a porter he would go in uh, at weekends evenings and he would take patients down to the mortuary did that give him access to the mortuary to victims yes it did uh, there is no evidence actual evidence that exists other than anecdotal evidence that he sexually abused anybody that was dead so my focus in terms of Savile is about evidence. So if you tell me something, uh, until such time as I have that referenced by somebody else or I can, can validate it by somebody else telling me, either not, not connected or because the times link up and everything like that, then what you're telling me is information, but it's not intelligence. It's not something of evidential value. So in terms of that, what I would say is that I saw nothing that supported the accounts, and they were limited, that he had had sex with dead people. And I'm not quite sure why he would, because he spent so much time wanting to have sex with people who were, or sexual contact with people who are alive. I'm not quite sure why he'd want to do it with anyone who's dead. That's a very different type of offending behaviour. How rare are necrophiliacs, and what would have shaped Savile into that kind of behaviour? Would he be, be born with something wrong with his brain, or would it have been factors that happened throughout his life? 
I think Boris summed it all up uh, in a very matter of fact sort of way. He's not a professor. He's he, you know he's a, a Londoner, uh, and he he said it as it is. And uh, with uh, necrophilia, uh, basically, a, a pe especially a paedophile, uh, he's got a young child or a a woman, a young woman or a man in case of Dharma, is helpless. It's completely under, and now we've got to remember that uh, Savile was a control freak. He was an extreme narcissist. He was a control. He's a sexual predator, and so if he thought a young girl's laying on a mortuary slab or was a woman on a mortuary slab, it's like again, as Boris said, a sweet shop. The mortuaries became sweet shops for him. It was known to have access to corpses. It is known that he had. Um, necrophilia, you know what I mean? He's, he did double on that. So, so, the allegations of the necrophilia going back to the Leeds General Hospital yeah. period, yeah, yeah, it's not just Leeds, there are many other hospitals at a later date, but Leeds General seems to be the one. Him and Franey had a very good partnership, um, which will come to light later on. But, um, Franey is another influence in his life. What do you think made him have this fetish for corpses? I'm no expert. Yeah. I could not tell you that. I mean, it's, um, is it a power trip? You know, somebody's dead there on a slab. You, you know, I mean, it's, I don't know if Christopher could describe it. If, you, you know, if someone was, I'm here, you're not, I'm going to take, you know, I mean, it's, I can't, understand what made him go through that um, phase of life for, to me to, to the day I die I wouldn't be able to work it out it's beyond people's comprehension isn't it because it's yeah. so bizarre now I've interviewed over 30 of the worst serial killers in the world the very worst cannibals necrophiliacs the worst in prisons around the world and when we know that Jimmy Savile was going into the mortuaries and hospitals, shutting the door, dimming the lights, pulling a corpse out of a cupboard, laying it on a slab, and having sex with it. You're in the realms of Jeffrey Dahmer, uh, Douglas Clark, the Sunset Slower I've interviewed, who wanted to open up a mortuary and have sex with the dead with a girl that was at one time dating Kenneth Bianchi, the Hillside Strangler. You've got Dennis Nilsson, the London gay guy that was killing and having sex with dead bodies. If you had a Stephen King horror movie, even he could not imagine this long blonde-haired man gloating, his eyes coming out on stalks, smoking a big fat cigar, sidling into a mortuary and playing with dead children. In one hospital, Great Ormond Street, a dying child was touched inappropriately. What do you think about Jimmy Savile being given access to Broadmoor? Yeah, it's just insane. Absolutely blows my mind. Because uh, now... Well, and, and in the recent past, in, in the last sort of five, 10 years, the security of, of Broadmoor is really high. So every time I went in as a, even the regular members of staff, even the uh, consultant psychiatrists who work there every day, they had to go through an airport level of security to get in and get out every time. Um, and there's really lengthy background checks. So not too dissimilar to working in a prison. So, you know, once you apply for your job and you get the job, there's another at least four or five months of the, them doing security vetting. So that's what happens now for staff to get into Broadmoor. So taking that into context, somebody who's not even a staff member to be given his own keys, he's a celebrity. I just, I, I just can't understand it. Cannot fathom. 14 crimes were recorded across 28 police forces. Offences occurred in 13 hospitals, including a hospice. Here we have a very special, unique unit, patient in bed, and for every figure, a very personal trauma. For every figure, someone asking why. 
Caroline Moore was molested by Savile at Stoke Mandeville Hospital when she was 13. Why were they missed opportunities? Why was the man not prosecuted? Why did these people not do their job properly? Why, when there were even hints of um, uh, maybes, that uh, maybe Jimmy Savile was doing this or maybe Jimmy Savile was doing that, why was this not looked into thoroughly there and then? Clearly, the, the obvious conclusion is that people must have been aware. In 1994, two former Duncroft girls went to the Sunday Mirror to give their account of being assaulted by Savile in the 70s. The paper decided not to pursue the story for fear of costly legal action. Fourteen years later, former pupils from the approved school gave testimonies that led to the first exposure of Savile's dark side. One former Duncroft girl, speaking in the aftermath of Savile's exposure, explained... He did it in such a way that he could always cover himself. You knew it was your word against his, and your word would never be believed. He manipulated situations. We were vulnerable and in need of love and attention. So for the people watching that then, Doncroft's uh, schoolgirls was, uh, uh, it was in Surrey, in this county, wasn't it? And what, what kind of girls ended up there and what happened to the runaways? The type of girls that ended up there will be the ones that ended up in court with orders, you know, we're taking you away from your parents, you, you're not going to school, you, you know, bunking, you're, you're shoplifting, you're doing whatever. So this was, what I would say is the equivalent of a male-approved school. They were placed there for a reason, um, for education. Um, Jimmy and his brother, John, um, claimed that girls were sending Jimmy letters, fan letters. This is seems to be some sort of rules that he used. So he wrote to the headmistress at the time, said to her, look, I'm getting letters from girls, would you like me to come and visit? That was his in. Then he's in the situation now of he's got a sweet shop to play in. This is, I'll put it bluntly, this is what, you know, it is to Jimmy. It's a sweet shop I've got all this to play with. It wasn't until later, around about 2011, that two of them actually come forward and claimed that he raped them. His brother did as well. So there was about seven or eight cases. But at the time, it was brushed under the carpet because if you bear in mind, you've got someone at an approved school that's gone out and committed theft. Then you've got Jimmy, who's a public figure, spins records for a living, he's on telly. Who are you going to believe? You're going to believe someone is in the wrong? Or are you going to believe Jimmy, who's, who's buttered up to be some kind of demigod? In the 1970s, Savile was a regular visitor to Hort de la Garenne in Jersey. Six weeks ago, police in Jersey started the grimmest of work, digging up the cellars in a children's home. It was in response to accounts by former residents that they'd been locked up, mistreated and abused there. Jersey's police admit victims of sexual abuse at this former children's home have been trying to get authorities to listen to them for years. The lead investigator, Lenny Harper, says the evidence of their suffering is beyond doubt. There are allegations of care home kids getting pimped out from that era yeah. do you have any information about savile being a participant in that savile savile was what i would call the kingpin he was the person that would be sitting at the top and and a wanted a boy so let's go to savile he can supply um a boy of whatever age or a girl of whatever age and it was known and it is known um, that Savile uh, pimped out youngsters. Um, he, he um, I mean, what you've got to take into account as well is if you're a young lad or a young girl and you see Jimmy Savile, oh, he's famous, here's my route to fame. Okay, they could promise you the world and all the rest of it, and all of a sudden they're, they're around the back butt raping you, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, he, he was prolific. 
So David Icke, many years ago, said that Savile got away with his crimes and had access to such powerful yeah. people and royal people because he was a procurer. So that, that ties into exactly what you yeah. just said. You, yeah. you think that David Icke was correct in that? Yeah, I think David, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm gonna, I'll be honest, I'm saying I'm not a lover of David Icke. Like some things he says are right, some things I pretend to disagree with, but this time he's spot on. Was several a unique case, or were there many sexual predators targeting the Kerr homes back then? Oh, there were there were there was a whole uh, host of people who I mean, you know, I think there's several hundred predators have been actually uh, jailed, and God knows how many others there were. So I mean, it was it was it was. It was widespread. Um, there are some links between some of them, but as I suggest, I don't think it's all about paedophile rings. I think it's more about kind of uh, individuals targeting these homes and then uh, and then maybe linking up sometimes um, uh, with each other. It was difficult uh, to find institutions that hadn't had some sort of record of... of uh, Abuse, you know, the, the, that the more you 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 found, the more uh, there there were cases that that would uh, come. I mean, I've, certainly the police investigations that I list in my book, um, you know, resulted in lots and lots of prosecutions, and lots of those were successful. Of course, uh, sometimes you just couldn't get the prosecutions uh, to be successful. You didn't have enough evidence or whatever, but they did prosecute a lot of people. So in the 1970s, if a child reported abuse, could you give us a step-by-step -step account of what would happen next? Well, that, the, the problem with that is who would they report it to um, and who would be likely to, to, to believe them. Um, and I do think that it would have been very difficult for a 14-year-old child in a children's home to walk into a police station and say that, you know, so and so has abused me. I just think that uh, they would have said, uh, "Yes, laddie, <laughs> uh, that's all very well, but uh, it's your word against his." And um, you know, be a good lad and um, uh, uh, go back home. You know, I think it's interesting that, that almost whatever institution you name, this sort of stuff went on. Whether it's sports, whether it's uh, you know various other leisure, you know, uh, scouts or whatever, uh, whether it's uh, children's homes, uh, whether it's kind of schools, uh, you know, boarding schools, you know, all these institutions kind of have had, you know, we could spend all day talking about stories from all those institutions. So my Jim Savage story is this. He used to come to children's homes and give children's homes gifts. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so it's nineteen. It's nineteen sixty-five. Yeah, 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 yeah. My mum's had a breakdown. We've gone into care. We've ended up at at at. at, at I didn't remember. I only remember when I got the D the subject access report, yeah, that it turned out to be Wootton Vale Children's Child Assessment Centre. In 1980, in the 80s, it was closed down as part of Operation Care. Operation Care was a police operation. There were 29 arrests. About 13 people went to prison for physical and sexual abuse on children. Yeah, right. That was in the 80s. I was there in the 60s. The copper that got my child files first, read them first, who was doing the historic, because I, I made an historic allegation. He, he comes in, he says, Stephen, I've read your child files. He goes, and the heroin. He said, the heroin to read. He said to me, you've got two brothers and two sisters. He says, are your elder siblings white? Uh, uh, and they are. They look. They look. They, they, they've got. If I have a kid with a white baby, it looks white. Yeah, with a white girl, it looks white. They, they, their dad's my colour. My dad's full black. Yeah, right, right. So they look white. They went into foster homes. Yeah, me and my sister, because of because we were dark. Yeah, right. And it's 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 river, rivers of blood speech time and uh, um, Enoch Powell time. Yeah, yeah. 
Det kunne, det kunne den foster hos. Så de sendte mig til der Victorian Hell Hall. Ja, ja, right in the 60s. I came, ja, ja. He gave me the fire engine with the yellow leather and the bell on it. Yeah, yeah, right, right. And he tried to fill me up. Mm. Yeah, he tried to fill me up. But uh, uh, um, I just whacked him, automatically whacked him in the face, and the hard plastic ladder cut him on his eye, which stopped him. Now, I was moved from that home on the 23rd of December, which is the day before Christmas Eve. Who gets moved? This is the questions that I, I wanted to ask in the court. Why does a kid get moved? When everywhere's closed down, yeah, when when everybody's starting the Christmas break, yeah, right. I got moved because of that incident. Yeah, it's nowhere in the paperwork, but I was there and he was there. Yeah, yeah, right. And the police officer I got the emails from the police officer. He said, if he was alive today, with what you said and what we know about him, we charge him. Yeah, 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 we charge him. That was enough for me. Yeah, right. Because they they they're pivotal things, pivotal things in my childhood that changed that changed me from. A decent kid, yeah, into a beast. Yeah, yeah, right. Because I then had no trust of adults. Yeah, yeah, right, right. I've been getting whipped and care and wired. Yeah, yeah, right. And I liken myself. I, I like dogs. You get two dogs. Yeah, yeah. And you beat and beat and beat one dog. Yeah, yeah, right. And you beat and beat the other dog. Two things happen with the dog. Every time you go near the dog, it lifts its leg and starts pissing. Yeah, yeah, right, because it's terrified. Or every time you come near, it tries to bite your leg off. Yeah, yeah, right. And then it ends, up, it ends up a junkyard dog. I ended up a junkyard dog. That's what that's what I ended up. So I know what's happened to me. I, I know why I am the way I am. I know I know exactly what was done to me and why I am the way I am. It was only a bit later that, I, a bit later than after Jim will fix it, in fact, you know, that I... And when I was a, a journalist on the independent newspaper and stuff, that I, I began to, I, I did kind of hear rumours. We all heard rumours. I mean, all of us journalists heard rumours about Jimmy Savile. That, that is kind of slightly shocking, but it is true that, you know, we, we were, there were a lot of suspicions about him and about, you know, certain other people uh, that, uh, you know, they were up to uh, no good. Jimmy Savile went to Beachheim in 1972 and I remember being in the dormitories and looking out and seeing these sunshine coaches that were a link to Jimmy Savile. Now, the only way I can explain to you about Beachheim, to me, Beachheim was like a sweet shop to a paedophile. Mm. So Jimmy Savile would have been at home in, in, in his element with children, being able to do what he could do, in terms of Jeffrey Banner bouncing them off the knee, he's done that in so many times in Jim Fix where he, he had children on his lap and stuff like that. That reminds me of the same of what Jeffrey Banner did to me. Uh, 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 and he was in Beach Home in 1970. That's the only record that I know at the same time I left. I wasn't there when Jimmy Savile was there, but he was in Beach Home in 1972. But it is with the benefit of hindsight. But when you watch, particularly Top of the Pops, which is this big pop show uh, that, that you know, went out once a week with the, all the latest hits and stuff, and years and years, and it had different presenters every week, and 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 Jimmy Savile would be there, and you know he always had his arm around some young woman or some boy. There's or, a video on it, YouTube yeah. on Top of the Pops where he's got his hand up a girl's skirt. Yeah, and it's number one time. Still, some of Savile's behaviour was in the open. Dame Janet says the lady in distress here on the left later complained about being groped on top of the pops and her sexual assault wasn't taken seriously. It is extraordinary that it was never properly challenged and, and there were certain people at the BBC who did either know about it or had were the source of complaints about him and, and uh, didn't, didn't do anything. But it does, I think it demonstrates all the same things that happened in the children's homes that I wrote about, that, that you know, he was in a position of power. He um, certainly did things like visit children's hospitals that were deliberately kind of to give it, not because he was a nice bloke being a, you know, being a, I mean, he worked as a, as a, as a porter in, in hospitals deliberately, which gave him, lots of access to patients on the moment picking up their old cups of tea and st stuff and and it was a perfect kind of dis i mean it was absolutely 
the same as you know a care home worker getting getting a job in a children's home uh, to have access to kids. It was it was all kind of uh, completely uh, deliberate. The youngest child abused by Savile was eight. Offences occurred in 14 different schools. He would access schools through the vehicle of the Jim Will Fix It programme and it's that cult of celebrity that he exploited to get himself into the Bruce, positions so where he, he could abuse. So he was responding to children's letters, that's how he got into these schools? Yes, I, but that's what the victims have been telling us. There was just not a culture of kids being believed in a way that is completely different 50 years on. And, and I can't emphasize that uh, uh, enough, that, that nowadays we would just, you know, the, the kid would much more likely be listened to. Not always, not kind of 100%, uh, uh, you know, sometimes not reflecting the seriousness of what goes on and so on. But by and large, uh, it would be a different story. In 1963, two boys aged 11 and 14 appeared in Salford Juvenile Court. They pled guilty to stealing a watch from Savile's flat. The 11-year-old was fined and the older boy was given two years probation. Nobody knows whether they broke into the flat or had been invited by its owner. After Savile was exposed, a joint report by the Met Police and the NSPCC recorded that up to a dozen people had made allegations of sexual assault by the paedophile during the early 60s. One had been a 10-year-old boy who'd spotted Savile outside a hotel and had asked for an autograph. He had been raped. Another report was of a male victim from Cheshire who tried to report being raped by Savile in 63. At the police station, he was told to forget it and to move on. Is there a threshold of an amount of victims and matching details that the police need to prosecute? The simple answer is no. But of course, the stronger the evidence, the greater the weight of the prosecution and the likelihood of a successful conviction. Crown Prosecution Service has to go through certain elements in terms of uh, of being an acceptable lever to bring a charge. Uh, and one of those, of course, is that they have a reasonable likelihood of a successful prosecution. So the stronger the evidence, the better. And in terms of victims, so what you want to do in terms of victims is you want to get some similarity between their accounts. In other words, they're both so they're all saying that this is how they groomed me. This is what they did to me. This is what they said to me. This is how they behaved. You also want to get some similarity between the manner in which that they were communicated with, they were contacted with, perhaps the locations they've been to. What's really important is to also get some independence between victims so that they don't all know each other. They haven't communicated with each other. There's no no um, suggestion that there's a collusion between what they're saying and of course the more victims you can possibly get so when we investigated Savile we started from a point of one victim we then got to five victims and I remember saying to the network when that when we showed them five victims they said well keep going and I said to I said to the lawyer for how long? How, how many victims do you want before we are in a position to do this story? And he came back and said, that's a very imp interesting question. I don't know how much the channel wants. And I said, well, listen, you know, it's, it, <laughs> I've only got an hour I can tell a, tell a story in. That's a, my program is an hour. We can't do them justice if we have any more than five victims. And what I'm not going to do is go and get more victims that I can't tell their story for because that's a massive impact. You know, I take great care in the people that I work with. And when I do go and speak to people and when I interview them, what you don't want to do is bring all this trauma up and then not deal with it. So so there was a, there's a real responsibility we have as programme makers. And so when we got those five victims, I remember there was a concern whether they wanted, they thought that was enough, but they didn't come back and said, actually, do you know what? That is enough. And the, the, the similarities between the manner of the offending behaviour, the similarities between the way that he conducted himself with them and the types of offences were so common. There was a common thread through his offending behaviour that he it could only be him as being responsible. 
Savile clearly cultivated close relationships with cops throughout his life. From his days as a DJ in Manchester and London, right through to his Friday morning club socials, which continued until his death. Did the officers in Manchester in the early days enjoy the company of his groupies? It wasn't uncommon for the police to be entertained by Savile at his flat in Salford. If he plied them with teenagers, what would they do for him in return? So in total, you have... So so after our programme, we had 450 people came forward to make allegations, and that resulted in 214 crimes recorded. And those crimes are, in other words, people who have come forward and said, we were raped, we were touched by him. So that resulted in 214 separate crimes. And what they established is that that was between a period of 1955 and 2009. So that's a shocking period of time. And they established that there were seven separate occasions where, or seven separate victims where the police had information which could have resulted potentially in an investigation. And I'll take you through them. So the first one is 1964. So there is a piece of intelligence that sits in the Metropolitan Police Files where Duncroft girls were going to a flat in the Metropolitan Police area and they were associating with a convicted sex offender. And Savile was connected at that address, right? So as a result of that, that intelligence went into the police system in 1964, but nothing happened with it. So if you take it in its simplistic form, the very first time that people knew that Jimmy Savile was connected to the sexual abuse of children was 1964. And then there was an anonymous letter in 1995 now this anonymous letter is absolutely crucial and if you it's worth reading the anonymous letter if you haven't already done it it sits in with the hmic um, report that letter was written by an anonymous anonymous person who clearly knew both savile and one of his victims and what that person said is that this individual is incredibly powerful he will attack anybody who has a go at him he has the influence and the power of politicians and the royalty behind him. And he has had to change his telephone number because a child that he's been abusing, a young rent boy is the fr phrase that they used to use in those days, but basically a child who he had been sexually abusing uh, was trying to blackmail him and he'd changed his number. It then went on to say from the, the writer of the letter is that you have the powers at New Scotland Yard to properly investigate this. I've done my bit. I've told you about what I know. And it was quite detailed in the letter. It's now up to you. That letter, the police did nothing with. There was clearly information in that letter which could have been followed up. None more so than simply establishing whether or not there was a criminal offences against Savile in terms of allegations being made. But nothing was done about that. That letter simply went nowhere. Um, and then... There was, in 1963, a report. So, th so those are formal reports that sit within the documents. Then there are a separate report that have been found through intelligence documents. And that was in 1963. A man goes into a Cheshire police station to make a report of rape, naming Savile. The Cheshire police officer tells him to go home and move on. Forget about it. Astonishing. So you have a victim of sex abuse, goes to the police station and gets told to go home and forget about it. That was a sign of the times. That's what happened in those 1960s, 70 periods of time. Um, in nine, again, in 1963, a man and a woman who'd been to one of the productions of, I think it Top of the Pops or something, he, the, he goes to the police station at Vine Street Police Station, the Metropolitan Police Area, and says, my girlfriend was sexually abused by Savile whilst at the studio and the police officer says you know how serious it is to make allegations like that you could get yourself arrested go away he leaves and then uh, 1980 there's a victim that comes forward to the metropolitan police who says that she was sexually abused by savile in his camper van now none of that goes anywhere so you've got three separate allegations two in 63 one in 80 
You've got a letter in 1960, sorry, a letter in 1995. You've got the report, intelligence report in 1964. So this is all pre-1990. It's up to 1980. But then the most significant things happen in 2000. So in 2003, a, a, another person makes an allegation that she was sexually abused at Top of the Pops. Nothing happened in relation to that. Uh, and then the two significant ones, which is in 2007 and 2008. So in 2007, three victims come forward to Surrey Police and say they were sexually abused by Savile. And then in 2008, a single victim comes forward and said they were abused by Savile. That led to the investigation that, of course, we all know about now. But what it does very clearly tell you is that prior to our story in 2012, which obviously broke it, the police were fully aware of Savile's offending behaviour, albeit in silos. So not all that information had been shared across different police forces. Uh, but had they have made the necessary inquiries, they could have done it. And what it does highlight, and it, the, the reports are critical, what it does highlight is the incompetence of the 2007 Surrey Police investigation, which was totally incompetent. In the aftermath of the Savile scandal, hundreds of victims came forward to tell their story. Quite a few stated they had gone to the police to report assaults, but no action was ever taken. Two women claimed to have made complaints about Savile to police in London and Merseyside. In both cases, no further action had been taken. We will never know if the women were exaggerating their claims or if the police neglected to pursue an investigation into Savile. What about the allegations that the police who attended his lunches, Jimmy Savile had access to so many teenage girls who were like kind of like groupy uh, category back then that he was supplying these girls to the cops who were attending his lunches? Okay, with, with like they disappear into rooms in his house with these girls. Yeah, and, yeah. I mean, if you read, up, I mean, Jimmy Savile had a few nephews and nieces, and uh, one of his nephews um, turned up at Jimmy's house one day, and it was noted by him that there was other young boys and girls there of a minor age, and there were people in high power places that were actually there at the time. Um. He managed somehow to be ushered out and he has said on camera that he knew back in the 50s and 60s that he was a sexual predator. He was grooming young girls and boys far back then. With the police, it's the same as the, um, uh, if excuse me, the, the woman who was in the 80s who had the, the whorehouse. Um, in America? No, it was in the. It was over here. She mm. actually there's a film about a personal services. <coughs> was the name of the film, and she had the police and everyone in their backhand, because the police were at it as well. So you don't know if there were officers there that were at it. Obviously, because he was supplying, money talks. Jimmy's big. There's power. We can gain access to anything we want. It could be drugs. It it just snowballs. It snowballs. We do know for a fact that one former Duncroft pupil did go to the police in 2007. She reported Savile's historic offending to Surrey Police, who did conduct an investigation, albeit a highly incompetent one. This investigation started a series of events that would eventually lead to the exposure of the celebrity sex offender. Surrey Police registered Savile as a suspect and his file was added to their police computer system for dealing with serious crimes. They also made contact with West Yorkshire Police, where Savile was resident, to check if there were any intelligence on him. The information was not passed on for several months. A dozen ex-students from Duncroft were spoken to Things moved forward when a second victim confirmed Savile's abuse. Surrey police were dealing with a tricky situation. They knew he had expensive lawyers, 
They knew the backlash that would engulf them if things went wrong. Also, the victims were aware of Savile's power and influence. And both women were reluctant to give any evidence. They didn't realise it at the time, but by giving evidence, other victims would have found the courage to come forward. We have seen this happen with similar cases involving powerful people like Harvey Weinstein or Bill Cosby. Multiple victims coming together would have made a stronger case. In Savile's case, hundreds would have come forward. It was a massive mistake by Surrey Police not to realise that point. So you mentioned the royal protection and political protection that he had. When I read um, Princess Diana in her own words, the book, she talks about when she's having trouble with Charles. Yeah. Savile's brought in as like a marriage guidance counsellor. Mm. How does someone who just was a DJ from the North, poor background, enter the highest level of royal circles without some background check? And, yeah. you know, isn't this, don't, doesn't MI5, MI6 look at these guys? Anyone who goes in there or the Royal Protection, please look at anyone who's going to go in there and see their entire history and mm. filter people like this out? So, um, I mean, there's lots of issues there. But in terms of why he ended up becoming a bit of a confidant for Prince Charles, so the Duke of Edinburgh uh, personally asked Savile if he would give some guidance to Prince Charles in relation to his, into his relationship with uh, Lady Diana. Now, of course, if you look at that on the outside, you might go, OK, that's fair enough. But then look about Jimmy Savile. Jimmy Savile had never had a former formal relationship with anybody he was single he was weird at best he had had previous allegations made against him now of course i'm not suggesting and there's no evidence that the duke of edinburgh knew anything about that he just simply saw him as this this larger than life character and thought that he might be useful for giving some guidance to prince charles and of course when you are a royal and particularly more so then than it is now your circle of confidence is really small. You really don't know who to trust. So you you have a limited number of people to whom you can share things with. And they obviously felt confident that Savile was a safe pair of hands in, to, in order to tell. And of course, Savile kept thousands of secrets. So yes, he was in one sense a very safe pair of hands. But of course, the secrets that he kept primarily were for his own benefit and also in relation to his own offending so you can see why he got involved in that why did mi5 why did the um monarchy not know about his offending behavior again what we don't know and it's never been never been uh, as any of the reports is the totality of who knew what within the government organisations and particularly with the honours, etc. Who knew what about Savile? Savile had an individual who was promoting him in every element within Whitehall as far as getting him to the honours area. I mean, he was decorated in every element. He was a papal knight. He was Sir, OBE. He was the lot. I don't think there was anything else he didn't have. So he had backing within Whitehall. He had backing within government. And I think as a result of that, and because of his status, this was a man who was elevated to a status of, of effective, ro almost royalty, royalty within television anyway, um, that made him untouchable. And I think what it also meant is that people didn't ask questions. They took it as a given that he was okay without saying, but is he? Is this the right person that we want? Ultimately, in 2009, the Crown Prosecution Service killed the investigation by making the decision not to go ahead with the case. A CPS lawyer recommended the police should make contact with Savile to inform him about the allegations. The senior officer on the case wrote to Savile and received a phone call from Jimmy himself. What's interesting is that Savile stated that he had a West Yorkshire inspector who usually deals with this sort of thing. The inspector in question contacted Surrey Police shortly after and told his counterpart that Savile was a personal friend. He also revealed that Savile got so many of these types of complaints. 
Sorry Police found these comments highly unusual and requested information on any allegations against Savile as they wanted to build their own intelligence picture. West Yorkshire Police still didn't forward anything. Months passed and Surrey Police had to formally request to interview Savile under caution. Arrangements were made to conduct the interview at Stoke Mandeville on 1st of October 2009. Of course, Savile dominated the interview. The two female officers from Surrey Police set the tone by asking if it was okay to call Savile Jimmy. For the entire interview, they deferred to the famous paedophile who regaled the officers with tales of his fundraising and television work. One of the officers put the three allegations to Savile, two relating to Duncroft, one to Stoke Mandeville. Savile flatly denied each allegation as they were read out. He was not pressed on any of his answers, and he turned the tables by warning of the expensive lawyers he employed, who could take a case to the Old Bailey if things were to go any further. Revealingly, he talked about his close connections with West Yorkshire Police, stating, We showbiz people get accused of just about everything. That's why I have up in Yorkshire a collection of senior police persons who come to see me socially. But I give them all my weirdo letters and they take them back to the station. So that was that then. Surrey police had allegations from three different women saying that he had sexually assaulted them in the past. Jimmy Savile said this was simply not true. Surrey police then wrote letters to the three accusers to inform them of the outcome of the case. Operation Ornament was closed. What's shocking is that nothing was followed up. The officers simply took Savile's denial and left it there. His word was more powerful than the testimonies of three accusers. Before Operation U Tree, Theresa May, Home Secretary at the time, commissioned a review by HMIC to establish which police forces received reports and or allegations in respect of Jimmy Savile. All 43 police forces in England and Wales were involved in the 2013 report. Records showed only five allegations of sexual assault by Jimmy Savile between 1955 and 2009 had been recorded by police forces. Three forces had in fact investigated Savile in his lifetime. The Met, 2003. Surrey, 2007 to 2009. Sussex, 2008. Any intelligence on Savile from any police force in the country should have been given to West Yorkshire Police where Savile resided. Yet they claimed to know nothing about his dark side. HMIC concluded its report by stating that police officers in West Yorkshire may have been inappropriately close to Savile. This shows negligence on a grand scale, possibly worse. Did certain individuals cover up for Savile? Now we'll never know. What we do know is that intelligence on Savile wasn't shared amongst police forces. And if it was shared with West Yorkshire Police, those records vanished. Did someone high up in that force intercept reports and intelligence on behalf of Savile? Possibly. West Yorkshire Police cleared themselves of any blame in the whole affair when they investigated themselves in the wake of the scandal. Operation New Green was merely an exercise in damage limitation and blame shifting. Yet retired officers from, and others who spoke anonymously, offered a different picture. And apparently if a complaint came in about him across the country, it was reported to his home jurisdiction. Yeah. And there was one cop in charge of receiving those incoming complaints. And that was a cop that attended his weekly lunches. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's, you couldn't, you could not make this up. I mean, it, it, Jimmy, uh, it, from the start, he had everyone eating out of his hand. He was literally, I probably guarantee you, Sean, that if he was sitting in front of you, you could be taken in by him. You know, you, you were talking about a man that was knighted by the Pope, that had a sure KGB. Um, he hadn't even had the status of being a, an honorary admiral for the Navy. He had a green beret from the Royal Marines. This is the extent of this guy um, put himself out there. You're not going to argue with someone who's who's that way. You know what I mean? And there was it's money talks. I mean, I do believe that it was money that talked with that that police officer because you got to bear in mind, never took the times backhanders. We've all seen the TV programs. We all know the stories about the backhanders to. People in the in the Met Police, Savvy Police, sorry, in a Amsterdam, you know, you name it, it's backhanders. So it was that culture at the time. It's money. And he was friends with Thatcher. He was friends with Prince Charles, and on and on it went, didn't it? One told newspapers that there wasn't a copper in Leeds who didn't know Savile was a pervert. There was talk of an investigation into Savile in the eighties. No records were kept. Again, we'll never know the truth. What role did his weekly luncheon for the police play in him being able to get away with more and more things? Power. I mean, with with the police, you you have got a situation where they are got, got to be one hundred percent that they are going to get a conviction with this guy whether it's the CPS or the police, they've got to be 100%. Because if it goes to court and he's found not guilty, the people that's brought the charges are going to look stupid. Their careers are going to go down the pan. But this, this guy's got power and money. He's a money-making machine. He's Jimmy Savile. He is the person you hear on the radio. It can't be Jimmy. He's too innocent. You know what I mean? It's the same as Rolf, Rolf Harris. It couldn't be him. He's too innocent. It, he pulled the wall over the police's eyes. He pulled the wall over politicians' eyes. Big time. I mean, you, you're talking from 1950 to... Two, uh, sorry, 1950, say, to 1998. Jimmy Savile was a sexual predator. A letter dated 13th of July, 1998, was sent to the Vice Squad at Scotland Yard. It read... I supply here information which, if looked into by one of your officers, will yield a secret life not unlike that of... Name redacted. I cannot give you my name as I am too closely involved and do not wish to be in the limelight. The letter described Savile's homosexuality and spoke of him being involved with a rent boy who had been given Savile's number in Leeds. The telephone number had been changed after Savile had received threatening calls from the rent boy who was going to the press and exposing his paedophilia if he did not give him more money. The letter continued. He thinks he is untouchable because of the people he mixes with. It concluded, When Jimmy Savile falls... And sooner or later he will. A lot of well-known personalities and past politicians will fall with him. The letter was forwarded to the Met's organised crime paedophile unit as well as West Yorkshire Police, who of course later lost it. Nothing was followed up. How easy would it have been to actually check if Savile had in fact changed his telephone number? Isn't blackmail worth investigating? Wasn't it worth digging deeper to find out if in fact Savile was a practicing paedophile? The officer who initially took the anonymous letter has spoken out and revealed that he did in fact send a copy to West Yorkshire Police. He also revealed that it was common knowledge among his colleagues that Jimmy Savile was a paedophile. He believed that one of his colleagues had been investigating Savile in 1989. 
The Jimmy Savile case is unique in so many ways. He was an odd and highly complex character whom the masses loved. He was part of our culture, synonymous with Radio 1, Top of the Pops and Jim will fix it, which I grew up on. We celebrated his celebrity. We repeated his catchphrases like now then, now then. We laughed when comedians did impressions of him. From humble beginnings, he reached the highest levels of society. He was brought in as a marriage guidance counselor when Prince Charles and Diana were having trouble. It's one thing to assume that he conned Prince Charles into helping him and Princess Diana into helping him and on and on it goes. But why on earth would the royal family bring Jimmy Savile in as a marriage guidance counsellor for Prince Star Princess Diane Charles? Wouldn't you have to have security clearance and trust at the highest level? You know as well as I do, Sean, I've worked in some secure places and my background is check filing. And I mean check filing. Your mum and dad, your nan and granddad, it goes back years upon years and they will pull you to bits left, right and centre. Now, the horrific thing for me is, is that Jimmy Savile had his own room in Clarence House. Now, Prince Charles and Lady Diana trusted him as well as um, the Queen, as well as um, the other known, Andrew, who's uh, currently under investigation. But he had his own flat. And the power that he had was he could sack Prince Charles and Lady Diana's staff, which he has done. They trusted him to the extent that they could sit down and have a conversation about their marriage. He was seen as, by them as well, a demigod. No, Jimmy can't do no wrong. You, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it's horrific to think that that man was around the children or around the future king. You, you know what I mean? There's, there's no story there that suggests anything went on, but if given a chance... Do you think that there's a degree of looking the other way? Because if Prince Charles's mentor was Lord Mountbatten, yeah, yeah, who had a history yeah. of yeah. that activity, do you think there's like an acceptability factor whereby it's it's not that a big deal to them? I mean, if they've done the background checks on him and they've discovered this stuff, I'm going to say in, in them days. I mean, what you what we got to understand is we're living in an age now where nothing is acceptable. Okay, and it should never have been acceptable anyway. But you're going back to a time in the 70s when, you know, somebody on top of the pots will touch somebody's leg or backside or whatever. Does, have you seen the clip of Savile doing that? Oh, I've seen it many a times, many a times. I've seen, you see him on Jim Will Fix It when he's got his arms around the girls and you can see where the hands are going. Uh, but it, it, you're talking about the 70s, 60s, when women were treated slightly different to what they are now, they wasn't expected, you know, they were expected to keep quiet. Um, not just Savile, you're talking about, as you rightly say, Lord Mountbatten. There's history in a fam the royal family of certain things going on. You could go back to Jack the Ripper, you know, was a part of the royal family involved in that. There's a lot of secrets there hidden. That we'll never know about. Thatcher. You know, they all whether they whether Prince Charles knew what was going on, I don't know. I can't answer that. And I can't answer whether Princess Diana knew, you know. I mean, they just see a mask. And what was hidden behind the mask was was quite horrific. Do you think that the royals should have done more? Uh, exercise more scrutiny of his background rather than allow him to access the highest level of the circles. I can tell you this, that if you try to get into a Category A prison today, you will have the most stringent security checks done 
and then you still might not get in. Right. You're telling me that Prince Charles with the MI5 and MI6 in his own security staff and own security team and you've got Princess Di and she's got her entourage and you've got the Queen and all this mixing about and not one single one of them had the brains and the wits to think, let's do an in-depth security check on Mr. Savile before we let him in here, or let alone him with 100 yards of this royal family. But no, they didn't. And that comes back to Mount Batten, and, and it's, it's almost as if it's like, it, oh, well, don't worry about it. That's the big question for British society. How did he get away with it? Six decades of abuse, and there are numerous examples from across the country and indeed within his own family of where children um, spoke out, tried to tell people in authority about what happened. But I think we were all taken in. You could say he groomed a nation. But eventually we learned about his dark side. He had fooled the entire nation. It took decades to realise how just a prolific sex offender he had been. He preyed on everybody, dead or, dead or alive. What do you mean by that? Well, he he, he liked visiting the morgue. Is that yeah, he been was verified? Yeah, um, it's been reported on many occasions. He loved visiting the, the morgue. And what would he do in the morgue? terrible things supposedly but um but he did terrible things to poor there were victims who complained who'd been suffering in hospitals who'd got cancer he'd abused them he didn't care young old man woman boy girl he was he was unique in that sense because he was you know jeffrey epstein liked young girls jimmy savile just liked anything The role he had cut out for himself in life had given him ample opportunity to repeat offend. Over time, he gained confidence, increasingly got away with it and became more brazen. He acted with impunity, with powerful connections in politics, royalty, health institutions and the police. He became untouchable. So I think the biggest problem about Savile is that Savile, we know about Savile's offending. We know about that very well. We know about his impact on society. But what has been lost is those people that could have stopped it from happening or those people who had knowledge about it. So out of those 44 reviews, not a single person has been held to account. Everybody has managed to, to evade any level of real responsibility. And I don't think that's right. And I'm not about get, blaming people. But when we make mistakes and when we get things wrong, I believe we have to be accountable. And particularly when we're in positions of responsibility. So if you are a police officer and your job is to investigate a crime, if you fail to do that properly, then you need to be held to account for that. So when Savile was interviewed in 2007 by Surrey Police, he was interviewed at Stoke Mandeville Hospital, where he had a bed, not his house, at his Stoke Mandeville Hospital. He interviewed, he did that interview on his terms, when he wanted it, where he wanted it. Surrey Police did not advise Stoke Mandeville Hospital of allegations, three separate sexual abuse allegations against him. He was working at the hospital. He had an access hospital and he had access to vulnerable people, young children at Stoke Mandeville. Yet he's being investigated for his indeed sexual assaults on three people and they didn't bother telling Stoke Mandeville. Total failure. Uh, he, they didn't tell Thames Valley Police of whose force area it was. Didn't tell them that. And the interview itself provided vital information that had the police officers bothered to follow up on would have shown Savile to be lying. But they just simply took what he told them as being true, dismissed everything else, the allegations against him, and did no investigations. 
So that, f uh, and he led the investigate. He led the interview. Um, and in a way, I didn't have, I don't have a problem with him leading the interview per se, because I quite like that sometimes because I like to give the interviewer, the, the person being interviewed, the feeling that they're very comfortable and lull them into a false sense of, of feeling that uh, they can say what they want. Because by and large, when people feel really comfortable, they talk they rather slip. than, yeah, rather than feeling under pressure. So my invest, my interviewing techniques for the very first interview was always to allow you to talk. You know, if, if, if it was the other way around, I'd literally be probing you on lots of things, but I'd be letting you talk loads if I was after stuff from you. And so that's fine. I don't mind them doing that. But there would have been a second interview where I'd have come back to you and said, well, what about this? What about this? They followed up on none of that. But those officers were nothing happened to them. You know, so and that's not just that the BBC. I mean, I, the Dame Janet Smith did the review for Jan for BBC. I mean, I so I am responsible for exposing Jimmy Savile. I have more knowledge about Jimmy Savile than probably anybody else. Perhaps not so much now because lots of other people have done work around it, but certainly at the time. They launched this this review and um, and I see a piece in the BBC news basically saying we're looking for anybody that has information about Jimmy Savile. And I wait and think, oh, well, someone will contact me from the inquiry. Nobody does. So I wrote to Dame Janet Smith's team and said, do you not want to interview me? And they came back and said, well, we don't know if you've got anything relevant to tell us. And I went, I went well, that's up to you to decide, <laughs> isn't it? I said, but you won't know unless you ask me. Anyway, so they did ask me to go along. So I went along, sat there with Dame Janet Smith with her lawyers. I didn't like the female lawyer. She was very arrogant. But Dame Janet Smith, and I said to her, listen, before we start, I said, I'm, you are very, you're eminent. That's absolutely fine. But I'll tell you the truth here. I've investigated this man for a long time. I'm very good at what I do. I have a, a, you know, a very good track record. To sit there and say to me, you don't know what I've got. You don't think I've got anything to say without even asking me what it is, is your first failing. And secondly, why would you not go to the person that starts all this off? I said, I've never done an investigation where I haven't spoken to as many people as possible to give me that piece of information. Anyway, we got to the end of it and she did apologise. She said, look, I'm sorry we got that wrong. <laughs> so fair play to her. <laughs> Savile manipulated and cajoled the environment himself. What we should not forget is that others who are still alive were complicit in enabling this monster. Savile may be dead, but we have learned that there are many people who got away with enabling his behavior. Remember the nurse who told the 12 year old girl who'd been raped to remain quiet, otherwise she might lose her job. Remember Claire McAlpine and how the BBC senior management had refused to allow her mother to speak to anybody about how her 15 year old daughter had been raped. Remember the West Yorkshire police inspector who had received all of the documents about Savile only to have them mysteriously and conveniently disappear. Not only did Savile get away with it, but all of his enablers have got away scot-free, unpunished. If the people complicit in Savile's behavior don't feel some guilt, then they must be psychopaths. This, this man was very, very odd. And he was excused because nobody dared not excuse him. You know, Esther Ranson, why didn't she say anything? You know, there are many people out there who could have asked questions, but because of this man being some national treasure. I mean, there's even a video of him on top of the pops on YouTube right now where he just puts his yep. hand. Up the skirt of anybody. Yeah, and she jumps. Yeah. So, you know, why did the BBC protect this predator? Um, because they created the monster and they didn't want to destroy them. If they destroyed their 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 cash cow then it would look very stupid on them i mean i'm going to be honest with you when you look at these inquiries and i've seen a 148 page report on broadmoor and the first 10 pages is 
this is appendix A, appendix B, it's like 10 pages of nothing. And then it gets down to the last 10 pages of, well, at the time, um, we were lived in a different era. We could get away with touching someone up the backside. They actually turned around and basically said, well, it's acceptable. No one's ever been brought to account for it. We just write a report and just brush it under the carpet. I mean, me and Christopher, have, well, Christopher, has put in FOI reports to Broadmoor Hospital. On an every occasion, they've fobbed us off. You know, they've come back and said, oh, uh, NHS or the NHS. Well, what do you mean? You're right, NHS. No, no, we're too different. We're the NHS or NHS. So all they do is, is the, the reports do nothing. You know, you know. I'm, I'm, if I can find a report that's going to turn around and tell me, you know, but there's 40 hospitals that he went round. Each hospital has got a 100-odd page report. The BBC, funded by the likes of me, you, you, and you, have just, yeah, we'll just do a report, keep them sweet and hide it, because that's how they do. Governments are saying they've, they've hired it, they won't come forward and turn around and declare they made a mistake. Broadmoor won't come declare they made a mistake. BBC will definitely not, but they will expect you to pay their money. What do you do in the caravan? A anybody that can lay my hands on. <laughs> now it's much more transparent because of social media i think the world has changed because frankly information spreads quicker so back then he he could just go well talk to my friend prince charles or he could have gone well talk to my friend edwina curry or talk to my friend margaret thatcher or he could have named talk to my friend the policeman and that's how he was able he 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 was a he was a genius in some ways because evil genius, but that man had a monstrous brain, and he obviously had a he just he probably didn't even care what he was doing by the end. He just just wanted to do it for the sake of it. He power comp. It's just he was an thoroughly evil man who was enabled by people just looking the other way. 214 crimes were recorded across 28 police forces. Offences occurred in 13 hospitals, including a hospice. And justice serves itself in many forms. Justice is not just about an element of punitive effect. And of course, in Savile's case, he was dead by the time I started investigating him. So there was no punitive element. But justice by being believed. For so many people, simply being heard and being believed in terms of what you're saying has the most amazing effect on people. We all know what is right and wrong. You know, some of the stuff that came out after Savile was people turning around and saying, yeah, but in those days that was okay. I've seen that. Let's be very clear, is it wasn't okay. It has always been wrong to sexually touch somebody without their consent or when they were a child. That hasn't changed. That's been there for years and years, decades and decades and decades. So anybody that comes forward and said it was okay, society didn't used to do anything about it. That didn't make it right. Society has now done something about it, and that's absolutely right, and so it should, because those people that were offended against didn't have a voice. They weren't able to be listened to. Now we listen to them. That's absolutely right. So when somebody gets away with something, somebody does something wrong, we have choices. We all have life choices. And if you take the wrong choice, then you take the consequences. And I think that the problem with Savile was everyone was terrified of him because he used to threaten to sue people. And there were all the, all the signs looked like they were there, didn't they? I mean... It, that Louis Theroux interview where he almost had him on the rails, you know. Um, and uh, I think it, it was a sign of the times, wasn't it? I mean, so many things um, that sort of went on 
over that time period where people just seem to turn a blind eye um, are quite extraordinary. I still um, shiver uh, when I look at that footage of um, Savile with, um, uh, the, oh God, the, you know, the guy who was the um, lead of the pack. Uh, the other paedophile who was um, my, my, my Gary Glitter. Gary Glitter. Have you seen yeah. that footage of them both on top of the pots together? I've not. No, is it on YouTube? Yeah. It just makes you shudder. But then you kind of, I don't know, do we all expressly in our heads will not want to believe that that kind of thing goes on? You know, it's, it's you know, there's, there's part, I think there's part of human nature. That, I mean, I met Jimmy Savile. You met him? I met him, yeah. What was that like? Well, you know, he's like big into running and he used to, and I had a disabled brother and I was pushing my brother around the serpentine with my granny and we were doing a sponsored run and up comes Jimmy Savile and <laughs> I guess I would have been quite young and he's perfectly, seemed perfectly nice and I think he was the best guy and he was, Jimmy Savile fixes it for everybody and he seemed like this great guy and I was just left with this great impression. And I'm sure that most people, if you weren't being abused by Jimmy Savile, had that impression of him. But it really took um, Mark Williams Thomas to, to basically, forensically, go through the cases and find a pattern of behavior. And it just goes to show, because how many victims he had, and it, it, you know, it took a documentary to find it was only like five victims that he pr produced to start with, who sh the patterns were behavior was so similar that eventually, but even then it was only after he died. And I just wonder if he was still alive, you know, whether that would have yet come out because it it's, you know, the, the rules and regulations about putting something like that on the telly and saying, this guy is effectively, you've got to, you've got to jump some real hurdles to do that. But when you are a young person and you're you're forming your understanding of life, because every child is a blank canvas, we learn from our environment. We learn from what's around us. So if we're seeing things that are sexualizing women, if we're seeing things which are showing us that that's acceptable, you know, if you're in an environment at home where there's domestic abuse, it's the norm where sexuality is something that's, that's openly discussed or shown or whatever, swearing, all of that lot, it becomes the norm. Drug taking becomes the norm. And this is what ends up happening, of course, is children then follow that path into adulthood. And that early days of offending behaviour, bearing in mind offending now could be anything from 10 to 11, up to the late teens. That is why that bracket of offending behaviour is so huge, because that's still the learning element once you get to your 20s and 30s, you start to realise that's wrong. But of course, you don't know because of the environment. That is why, as a society and as parents, we have such a massive duty to make sure that our children are brought up in the right way and not exposed to things that will influence their decision making. Do you think that without your documentary on Savile, it wouldn't have been as exposed as it was? You, oh, play, yeah, you I mean, played a, a key yeah, role. I mean, if, if we hadn't have exposed Savile, uh, so had if Newsnight had been able to get theirs off the ground, it w I do not believe it would have would have caused the ricochet, the impact that ours did at all, because they had a completely different story. So that's the first thing. And I think had we not have got Savile off the ground, then I don't think we'd be where we are now. Now, I can't say that with certainty because other things might have happened. Somebody else might have happened. But if the impact of Savile, I mean, Savile led to Max Clifford being arrested and prosecuted, Rolf Harris being arrested and prosecuted, uh, the um, It's a Knockout guy, Stuart Hall, being arrested and prosecuted, and not just those people who are in the public eye, but hundreds, hundreds of other people up and down the country where victims came forward and spoke about. Now, often we don't talk about those people because they're not in the public eye, but there are, Savile led to thousands of people being saved, hundreds of offenders being arrested, just in the space of, of, of a one-hour programme, a 47-minute programme with adverts. So I think it was a, there was a piece written in The Guardian the following day saying that, you know, this is a... Never had television defined a moment anymore. And I think it's true. I think if you look back 
in terms of some of the coverage and some of the stuff that's that's being talked about. I think that 47 minutes of television has probably been in the last 10, 20, 30, 40 decades one of the biggest changing moments. And of course, there's been other important moments. Of course, there has. But in terms of changing attitudes, changing public opinion, I don't think there's been a, a programme that's done. And I'm incredibly proud to be part of that. And and yeah, it was hard work. I mean, I, I, I've never really talked in detail of, of how hard it was and some of the hoops we had to jump through to get it broadcast but it was hard. You know, these these people who go, oh, you know, you, you made a programme, you put it out. I tell you what, that making that programme and getting it to air was the hardest thing that I've ever done and will ever do, I'm sure, in the rest of my life. Jimmy Savile couldn't have existed now because there would have been some person on the internet saying, no, 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 no. And eventually somebody would have to listen. Um, I don't think he could have got away with it in this era. But back then, he had the police, he had royalty, he had politicians, he had business people, he had BBC, he had everything. It's very likely that 400 of you will be injured in your cars tomorrow. You'll be within six miles of home and doing less than 30. And it's going to happen to a lot of you ladies. You'll be shopping, collecting the kids, going to the laundry. For some of you, the face you'll start out with in the morning won't be the same face you end up with by the evening. It's, it's horrific to think that 50 odd years that this man had free reign of the government, the NHS, the BBC, who were respected in 1940 because they were the voice of the British people and well respected by the people, that he managed to walk into every walk of life and destroy thousands of people. Life is beyond me. I, I could probably sit and talk for hours about this man and, you know, my specialist subject is Broadmoor uh, and that's, but this guy writing a chapter about Savile has just opened up probably the biggest can of worms that I've come across. You know, without uh, media coverage, without uh, the readiness of, of some newspapers to, to go down that line, and importantly enough to report stories that then kind of get other people coming forward. Uh, and I worry about this because, uh, you know, the resources for media investigations are much less these days. Um, you know, newspapers are, are, are dying. They're being replaced by the internet. Uh, there are some investigative websites on the internet, but, you know, they're fairly poorly resourced. I think one big loss in the UK and in the US is the sort of good local newspaper which which keeps an eye on things where the reporters go to the local uh, council meetings and so on and find out what's going on and they have contacts and that all that's gone that's just gone I mean the uh, so uh, one of the important aspects of that is if you hear of somebody, uh, or, or, or some case of abuse in some home somewhere that might then other people read about it and then come forward and so on. And that's much less likely to happen today. So, uh, you know, the media is much diminished in this regard. And that the, the media is an important part of the safeguarding of uh, the kids and, and these institutions. And, and unfortunately, uh, um, you know, because of... Uh, the, the internet because of newspaper sales declining because of uh, they no longer have advertising in the newspapers and so on um, we see much much less uh, uh, potential for those stories to come to light the report is called giving victims a voice in fact they have shouted it's the figures that reveal the depth of depravity that Jimmy Savile stooped to during his 54 years of abuse his youngest victim was eight the oldest, 47. They were abused in schools, in hospitals, 
and in television studios. You know, I welcome uh, programmes like yours to, that, that keep this uh, in the public eye because it's all too easy to, to think that this is this is just an awful experience. We should forget it. it's all in the past and whatever. It's not, and we have to stop it. I, I do think there's less of it now because of in, you know the institutions are better uh, able to, to withstand this. But nevertheless, we have to be vigilant. The effect of Savile, the effect of exposing Savile has changed people's lives. And, and I, I don't think I'll do anything. I, I do a lot of things all the time, but I don't think I'll do anything that will have such a massive impact. You know, through my life as a police officer, through my life now as an investigative reporter, I help people. I change people's lives because I give them some, uh, some justice, some closure, but nothing to the degree that exposing Jimmy Savile did. That brought it, the Savile effect changed people's attitude around the world for child abuse it changed authorities positions it made a massive difference and and i for that you know i'm i'm incredibly proud to have been involved with that i'm incredibly lucky that i had that opportunity and you know there are i suppose three people that made that happen which was my producer Leslie Gardner, my assistant producer, Rebecca Hogarth, and Alex Gardner, who was my exec producer. Without those three people by my side, uh, we would never have got this broadcast. One could talk a long time about why you believe in God, but to encapsulate it, I believe in God because, if nothing else, it's a good gamble. If we went through life thinking that when we die, we rot, and that's it, gone finito. Uh, that's all right, but it's much nicer to go through life with a faith, thinking that maybe when we die, we go on to even a better life than this. Uh, who knows? So just remember this, it wasn't the police that exposed Savile, it was a journalist. That's why the media is so important, especially the alternative media, because look at how mainstream covered this up. When the authorities fail to do their job, the media should hold them to account. If we take one thing from this documentary, and it's part of our mission statement on this channel, is that victims need to be taken seriously and their voices must be heard. The more we understand the nature of abuse, the more we can put in place measures to tackle the problem. We absolutely cannot allow another psychopath like Jimmy Savile to run wild, spreading his evil ever again. I kill you! I, I, yeah! A knife and a cushion, all that, like, yeah! And he's looking at me, and we went white, and 
Dave's gone now. <laughs> what is it about a tough guy that fascinates us? Imagine I'm hearing that and thinking I'm not going down today. If I go down today, yeah, I'm dead. We're bringing you the very best of our interviews with Britain's hardest men. They made the mistake of bringing Billy Cubs, iron bars and knives to a gunfight. No rules fighter bash, Stephen the Devil French and my best friend, Wild Man. Over two hours of terrifying tales of punch-ups, stabbings. That's what happens in that world. You, you leave people long enough, they get enough rope chain themselves. Attempted murders and exceptional all-round hardness. This film is available to rent or own on Amazon or Vimeo. Plus, the first 30 customers to order this film get a 30% discount on any Vimeo order. Click the link below to see if you're one of the lucky ones. This film will drop your jaw like a punch from the hard men we talk to. So why not order your copy today? This podcast is sponsored by Gadfly Press. We are proud to announce the publication of Britain's number one art forger, Max Brandert, The Life of a Cheeky Faker. And from the back cover blurb, Max the Forger is an artist and gentleman whose colourful lifestyle has spanned over 70 years. He has lived under the strict regime of Bernardo's children's homes, being an elephant handler in the circus, lived rough, busked his way from Brighton to Bombay, sold his fakes up and down the country, dined with dukes, socialised with celebrities, associated with gangsters, served time in prison, and donated tens of thousands to charity. And through it all, he has never stopped smiling and loving life and missing his mum. Quote from the book. Mr. Brandert, I do not see you as a malicious criminal, sighed the judge. But why, oh why, do you continue to use your God-given talent in this way? I just can't help myself, Your Honor. It's like an addiction, I grinned. Available worldwide on Amazon. Link in the description box below this video. Thank you for supporting our sponsor.